music is all about communicating something because ever since I remember as a child, I've always been two things. I've been a musician, I've been an environmentalist. So the first few songs that I actually learned how to play on the guitar or play on the keyboards were actually my own compositions. So I was a studio rat. I would get a brief from somebody in Europe. That brief would get over by about 10 o'clock at night. And then 10 o'clock at night, I would get a brief from somebody in Los Angeles. And that brief would, uh, I would deliver it by about two, three o'clock at night, sleep for about three or four hours and then start the cycle again. Like I recently did an album with this amazing Canadian Indian singer, a guy called Abhi V. Karnatic classical by training, but also a Hindustani classical singer. What I liked so much about him is that he's a singer who has been born and brought up in uh, Canada, but yet he's kept his Indian traditions absolutely intact. What I did was that I composed the entire album in a Tumri and Bandish style. Why can't we have that in India? Where people are happy with a niche audience and at the same time are able to make a living catering to the niche audience and not constantly thinking that, oh, I should get one million followers. In India, we've got something known as the Ravi Shankar syndrome. Everybody knows who Pandit Ravi Shankar is in India. Name one album of Pandit Ravi Shankar. Nobody knows. At any given point of time, I only have 11 sets of clothes. Fast fashion is one of the most polluting industries on our planet. A prime minister of a country gives you advice, you'll take it seriously, right? Yes. So, like last year, the total number of concerts that I did was 77 concerts in 17 countries. Performing at the UN General Assembly, I think the first time when I performed over there was extra special. Every single world leader has stood on that stage, you know, and given a speech. The Grammys, they have this thing that when you win the award, in, in the past, you get two minutes to give an acceptance speech. I've always wanted to collaborate with Arijit Singh. Uh, Arman Malik and me are very close friends, actually. So hopefully I'll get to collaborate with him. And same thing with Salim Suleiman, uh, Sunidhi Chauhan. I think she's got a spectacular show right now. Or one client did come to me, you know, the, this tune has to sound like a mix of, uh, you know, a piano and a tube light. <laughs> <laughs>
through my music and uh, and I uh, and I make music on things that I feel strongly about, which is the environment and which is uh, which is about society and about us as humans. So I have a lot of follow up questions. Yeah. One is uh, your uh, environmentalist, uh, your version of environmentalist is a little different. Correct. Uh, what is that version? How do? <laughs> so basically, there are always two ways to be an environmentalist. Uh, what I call the Greta Thunberg approach. Uh, Greta Thunberg being the Swedish uh, uh, environmental uh, activist. Yeah. So she uses doom and gloom and a post-apocalyptic, uh, you know, scenario, and she tries to shame people into action, which is also which is quite effective. And the second method is like uh, uh, Sir David Attenborough, you know, where Sir David Attenborough uses love, you know, uses uh, he what he does is that he showcases what is beautiful in this world, and he hopes that. Uh, when we look at that beauty and we fall in love with the natural world and we fall in love with the beauty of our planet, then we'll find it within ourselves to protect our environment, to conserve our environment and to sustain our beautiful world. So I have always gone on that second path that uh, I always, because they say that we as human beings, we will only protect things that we love. You know, that's how we are. We only protect things that we love. We only love things that we understand and we only understand things that we're taught. So I believe yes. that through my music, I've made it my mission to make everyone fall in love with the natural world, to fall in love with nature, to fall in love with wildlife and the forests. And then through that love, we will find it within ourselves to protect and to conserve and to sustain our beautiful, beautiful planet. And you actually, I mean, in in a sh in short, you don't work against the people, you work with the people. That is exactly what I love doing, you know, that uh, uh, even though protest is really important in a democracy, uh, I've not gone that path. I've gone to the path of that even if I do not like a person, I will still work with them. If I do not like a government or if I do not like an elected person or if I do not like a bureaucrat, I will still work with them and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and try to figure out what their motivations are and work towards uh, doing something that is amazing. So for me, it's very important to work with people rather than work against people. And you mentioned that 10 years, uh, approximately 10 years back, you found this purpose. Correct. Was this inspired by your meeting with uh, our Honorable Prime Minister Modi ji? True. So up to the time when I won my first Grammy Award, that is in 2015, some of my music would reflect the environment, some of my music would not, because I was making a lot of commercials for television and radio, and I was uh, doing all sorts of music. And uh, I remember that uh, once I won the Grammy Award, Prime Minister Modi had invited me to his office for a, uh, for a meeting. It was supposed to be a five-minute photo op but it ended up becoming an hour long discussion because we were discussing about the environment, about climate change. He was going to be visiting the climate change conference later that year in Paris, in Paris yeah. the Paris climate change conference, which was the biggest ever conference of nations and world leaders in the history of our planet. 195 world leaders coming together under one roof to try to decide the future of our planet and how to make a better world for our future generations. So he was going to be delivering a speech over there. He told me about that speech. He told me about what he's going to be doing over there. And then, he, and then, you know, and then he just inspired me. He said, like, you know, he, he felt that, uh, you know, that I'm so passionate about this. Why isn't my art 100% reflecting this? And of course, there was a lot of tribulations in my uh, thoughts, you know, that, uh, you know, there was a lot of fear that what if I jump into this and I'm not successful? How am I going to make my money? How am I going to make my livelihood? But then when he gave me, gave me advice, you know, when a prime minister of a country gives you advice, you'll take it. Seriously, right? Yes. So, so I took it seriously and I left his office thinking that this is exactly what I'm going to do. From now onwards, this is the only thing that I'm going to do when it comes to my art. The only kind of music that I'm going to make is about is about environmental consciousness and social impact around those areas. So I'm glad that that meeting happened. Yeah, <laughs> even me. <laughs> and thanks to him, we yeah. were able to find the purpose and follow it. Uh, you have won three Grammys. Correct. Uh, multiple awards across yes. the world. Uh, you have met the global leaders, Yes. Uh, worked on a global scale and performed in front of the most powerful people of the world. Yeah. Like when you perform at United Nations Assembly, yeah. General Assembly, you performed there twice. Uh, four times now. Four times now. Yeah. And there are 195 country representations. Correct. Uh, almost everywhere, uh, everybody in the world. Yeah. Right? Every country in the world. Uh, does it, uh, you know, compensate or convert into commercially uh, beneficial for you as well or not? I'm able to make a living, so I'm not a uh, I'm not a uh, hungry musician, as in like of course I'm hungry when it comes to the art, but what I meant is that I'm not a starving musician, so I'm able to make a decent enough living. But then at the same time, 
I do not have much responsibilities because I do not have children, uh, you know, and uh, basically, so I do not have uh, too much of expenses because of my journey in sustainability. I do not even own a car. Uh, so, uh, so that is eliminated the, the whole want of buying big cars and fancy cars and sports cars that does not have, that does not exist with me at any given point of time. I only have 11 sets of clothes. Uh, because I do not believe in fast fashion. Fast fashion is one of the most polluting industries on our planet. So I only have 11 sets of clothes. This suit that you see me wearing right now, you will see it in at least about 10 or 15 other Instagram pictures on my, <laughs> on my social media. Um, at the same time, I, ha I eat a vegetarian diet. I've got very simple preferences. So the thing is that uh, all of my money that I make actually goes back into, uh, uh, you know, into the causes that I believe in. Uh, so, I, so actually, uh, I'm not a rich musician, but I'm a comfortable musician because whatever my, and I do make money, but all of that money goes back. I mean, I think uh, uh, an art f form like this should be promoted more and more. Uh, I think, I remember you mentioned in one of the interview, uh, Pandit Ravi Shankar syndrome. Yes. You know, would you like to talk about it a little bit? No, sure. So <laughs> that is the, the reason that I took the path that I did in, uh, in having a more international career because, uh, what happened was that uh, when it came to Pandit Ravi Shankar, I mean, he's one of the greatest inspirations in my yes. life, not just because of his music, but because of the way he led his life uh, in terms of his musical career. Uh, so when I was very young, when I was around 19 or 20, I had uh, gone to San Francisco and I watched my first concert of uh, Pandit Ravi Shankar. And I remember sitting down in the auditorium and watching that concert. And up until then, I'd seen quite a few Bollywood concerts in America and even in Europe, I'd seen Bollywood concerts. And, you know, and of course, the Bollywood musicians are able to fill up complete stadiums and it's quite exciting, the concerts, it's beautiful and all of that stuff. But the only people who show up are the Indian diaspora. Now, with Pandit Ravi Shankar, I'm sitting down in the auditorium and I'm looking around and I'm seeing that the, the audience which is inside the theater is very representative of the demographic of the city itself. Like, for example, the city had about a 5% Asian population. There was a 5% Asian population inside. It was a 70% Caucasian population, 70% Caucasians inside. So I realized that this man is breaking cultural barriers. True. And he's reaching out to people who would normally not be exposed to Indian music. And he was playing pure Indian music. He wasn't playing an electric guitar. He wasn't, uh, you know, playing uh, Western pop music or rock music or heavy metal or, you know, hip hop or whatever. He was playing what is his core competency, uh, competency, you know, that is uh, Indian classical music. And it was quite amazing. And then I started realizing in India, we've got something known as the Ravi Shankar syndrome, where everybody knows who Pandit Ravi Shankar is in India. You ask anybody, they'll say the most famous sitar player ever, player ever. They'll say that, uh, you know, a person who single-handedly made Indian classical music popular everywhere else. Daughters are Anushka Shankar and Nora Jones, won the Bharat Ratna. Everybody knows all of this. But I challenge you, you go to on the street and you ask, any person on the street, name one album of Pandit Ravi Shankar. And he's recorded more than 60 albums. Go onto his Wikipedia page, you will see a list of True. 60 to 70 albums. Each of those albums have got multiple tracks. Name one track of his or hum a tune of his. Nobody knows. Yeah. And that's a, that, that is a problem because we are just not in touch with our own culture. And at the same time, you'll find better luck abroad where people who are not Indians will probably know his music. But then I wanted to break cultural barriers with my music. I wanted to have an emotional response on people through my music. And uh, that is the reason why I decided that my career had to be more international because people like Pandit Ravi Shankar, people like even Ustad Zakir Hussain, or even Ustad Nusra Fateh Khan, they all were appreciated for their music more outside than they were in India. And uh, my music is primarily Indian. So that's the path that I took. I'm so glad again uh, <laughs> to you know hear this. Uh, you know, being a, you just mentioned that you only have 11 suits. Yeah. And that's something very exciting for me. Because coincidentally, I'm not an environmentalist. Yeah. But I also have very minimal clothes. Excellent. <laughs> so, what are the other things uh, uh, which you do uh, being an environmentalist in your life? How does, how does it change your life? So, there are uh, a few things that I do. One thing that I don't do is preach. <laughs> so, I try to, you know, lead by example as much as possible. I try to do things and I say what I do. And uh, it, it depends on everybody's path because uh, in today's times, there's so much of mental health issues. There are so many issues where 
I mean, there is a huge happiness issue, you know, in this world. True. So uh, one should not impose things on people, you know, or or shame people into action. That's what I believe. People should just find their own path, and we just need to inspire people and. you know uh, and uh, probably showcase things that are easy for people to take up because what is needed right now is small incremental changes in everyone's lives so one thing that i can tell you is that during the pandemic uh, uh, or rather before the pandemic i never knew what happens to my garbage at home you know like for example uh, somebody would just pick up my garbage and you know and i do not know where it goes but it just leaves home you know that's all that i knew you know i throw things in my dustbin and i don't know where it goes but during the pandemic obviously you know i had to throw out my own garbage because uh, we did not have anybody working with us and then i was shocked that i'm throwing out two buckets of garbage every single day and i was wondering what is this garbage and i realized that of course it's food stuff and packaging and plastics and all of that stuff and i realized that i'm an environmentalist i'm a guy who's so proud that i'm uh, doing uh, so much for the environment and i'm so strong uh in my uh in my talks about it or in my music about it but i am throwing out two buckets of garbage so i made it my mission that somehow i have to reduce this to half a bucket and then i started making all of these amazing decisions that i'm not going to buy stuff which uses a lot of packaging if it comes with packaging i'm going to reuse it i'm not going to throw it away or i'm going to refuse anything that i cannot reuse and then within about like half a month or a month that garbage got reduced to half a bucket and till today I only throw out about half a bucket of garbage or even lesser than that. Uh you know every single day. Sometimes it's almost no garbage at all. So I guess this is what everybody can do. Just try to reduce your garbage and then you will start making all of these amazing decisions. The second thing that I do is that I get my carbon footprint audited every quarter. So just like how we get our finances audited, I get my carbon footprint audited with a with a agency. And what they do is that they audit my carbon footprint right down to my ink usage to my air travel to my ground transportation to my electricity usage uh to my buying of clothes and buying of any kind of products and things like that and then they come up with a carbon footprint every quarter and a water footprint we have a meeting and try to figure out how can we reduce it for the next quarter and whatever my impact is and it's impossible to have a zero impact the way systems are built around us today i uh, mitigate it through uh, uh through tree plantations and investment in renewable uh energy companies uh so that and then of course the other stuff that i mentioned about the clothes and about uh, the car and you know and things like that so i try to do my best so there is an agency who does this there are lots of agencies that do this oh that's that's something new to me yeah carbon footprint auditing so they call that so you can just contact one of these agencies and uh you know and uh, they will uh, they will just uh, audit you uh, every quarter and then that way you can lead a net neutral lifestyle which is not the uh, which is not uh, a guilt free lifestyle but uh, but uh, it uh, uh, it sort of makes us feel that you know that better than nothing it's better than nothing exactly yeah. <laughs> uh so i'm going to ask you a different question because sure. a lot of our audience are people who are aspiring to be musicians and uh, sometimes as a musician uh, in the initial days you only have in india few specific benchmarks yeah mainly bollywood movies yeah you know nowadays a little singles non correct singles rap but you have taken a completely different path and grammy is something which everybody dreams or aspires to be uh what is the process of a grammy nomination how does it the entire system actually works so for me the thing is that i can tell about what happened in my uh, career so when i started off my musical career uh, i started off doing commercials for television and radio and in a very short span of time i became quite successful at doing that i was working with jingle production houses all over the world in france and germany in uh, usa and singapore in uh, japan and uh, creating a lot of this and at the same time i was also expressing myself through albums and uh, i did albums with a whole lot of international labels like uh, water tower records water music records universal music emi uh, 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 sony bmg poland and uh, avatar records and buddha bar i was doing a whole lot of uh, music for all of these people so i became an independent musician uh, after m- on my 15th album so my first 14 albums were with major labels 15th album is when i became an independent musician and my mentor was this gentleman who was a former vice president at universal music a gentleman called rod lynam he basically helped me navigate through my career and you know and uh, and uh, when i told him that i wanted to turn into an independent musician he set up distribution for me he helped me set up my own label got the legalities in place and all of that stuff then my 16th album was my turning point uh, so that is the album which actually won the grammy award it was an album called winds of samsara 
And uh, that particular album, it was the highest selling instrumental album in the world uh, in 2014. And it was a very successful album. We won a whole lot of awards all over the world for that album. And that culminated with me getting the okay. Grammy nomination for that album. So up until then, I did not know much about, uh, you know, how about how the Grammys work. And then I started realizing how it works, that it's basically a membership process where uh, people become voting members of the Academy. And uh, to become a voting member, you have to be a person who is currently working within the music industry. And you have to prove that you're currently working and you're a creator within the music industry. Nobody knows how many voting members exist. But an educated guess would be around 20,000 all over the world. So it's a huge number. And these 20,000 people vote for the nominations and the winners every year. Now, it's sort of like a foolproof mechanism simply because uh, uh, not everybody can vote for all the categories. So, uh, so a voting member can only vote for a few categories, about three or four categories. So you're only going to vote for categories that you've got expertise in. So the only way, in my opinion, for an album to actually win a Grammy Award is that album needs to be very, very popular among the people who listen to that genre of music. Okay. So like, for example, uh, I won in the New Age category. So among the New Age music listeners, the album has to be really, really popular. Because a few of those people will be voting members and they'll end up voting for me. So that is the idea. And how did life change after the first Grammy? No, of course, it changed quite a lot. Uh, because pre uh, previously, prior to the Grammy, some people would take me seriously, some people would not. <laughs> now, a lot more people started taking me seriously. And then we also discussed about the meeting that I had with Prime Minister Modi and the life-changing uh, decision that I made after that. So life changed in a huge way. And then, of course, you know, it's uh, sad for me to say this, but I got more recognition in India only after I won the Grammy. Because once you get an international recognition, Obviously, yeah. people home uh, get to know you, especially since... And I don't complain about it because I was not a mainstream musician. I still am not. So it's always going to be a struggle uh, for me, uh, you know, not being a mainstream musician, it's always going to be me constantly trying to prove myself and constantly trying to find a wider audience and people who would possibly buy my buy tickets to my shows. This is always going to be a struggle. And I'm constantly struggling in that way. But the Grammy made that struggle a little easier simply because it's easier for me to introduce myself to somebody, you know, uh, because people do take you seriously if you're a Grammy Award winner. A few days back, uh, Savan Kotecha was here. Yeah. And uh, we got to know that uh, internationally, the songwriters owns the rights of the song for in perpetuity. Correct, correct. So all the albums you have done as a composer. It's completely owned by me. It's completely owned by you. Completely and owned by you. But this is also the case in India and people don't know about it. So the way that it works in India is that uh, when you're a songwriter, you basically have your songwriter share. You know, that uh, that is like, you know, 50%, uh, which goes so, to the, the lyrics writer and the uh, composer. And the composer. And that is something that you cannot assign to somebody else. Yeah. Because if you've written the song, how can you assign that credit to somebody else, you know? But a lot of people in India do not understand that, that you've got that songwriter share, but maybe you do not control as to what happens to your song. Publishing is not with it. Yeah, so maybe uh, you, that is controlled by somebody else. As you said, the publishing is controlled by somebody else. So you do not have a say in what happens to the song, whether it gets into language versions or it gets into a remix or it gets into a movie. You don't have control over that. But whatever somebody else does with your song, you make money off it. True. But that's also actually officially since the 2012 amendment. Correct. Uh, but in your case, you also own the publishing. Publishing not in all my albums. Okay. So sometimes I have to give up publishing. Uh, it's a trade-off, as you know. Because sometimes what happens is that uh, a record label, uh, they want skin in the game. And uh, they, uh, they, they, they want to market it in the best possible way. I want it to be marketed in the best possible way. So the only way for it is to give up control of the publishing so that they, uh, you know, they, they push it to the, uh, to the best, in the best possible way. Very more often than not, they do not. But uh, nevertheless, some, many times you have to trust a label and you have to do that. Like, for example, the last album that I did uh, with, uh, with Stuart Copeland, uh, Divine Tides, uh, the yeah. one which won us two Grammy two Awards. Two Grammys, actually. So that particular album also, we gave up, uh, I gave up publishing on that album uh, because I knew that the label will be able to uh, push it. There have been other albums also with Universal where uh, not every album, but a few albums that, you know, that we've just given up, uh, we've given uh, up publishing uh, simply because I knew that, you know, the label will be able to put in a lot more effort if they actually own the publishing. So, Ricky, uh, uh, you have been, uh, you have like around 20 years of career? No, no more than that, but now it's become over 25. 25 yeah. years. So, whenever somebody looks back to their journey, yeah, they always find those special moments in their journey. Yeah. Uh, and every special moments kind of give you a learning. Of course. 
So I would like to ask you, what are those special moments and what are those learnings which you inculcate and you practice in life? I guess uh, while I was doing commercials for television and radio, when I was doing jingles, one learning that I had was that uh, uh, to take criticism for my music. Uh, because uh, if a brand manager or if an advertising agency executive is paying you a couple of thousand dollars to actually create a piece of music for them, then they're not going to mince words if they do not like something because it either works for the brand or it does not. So in the beginning, I remember the first one or two years that I was doing it and uh, somebody would come to me and tell me that, oh, I don't like that piece of music or it's not energetic enough or it does not work for us. So the obvious knee-jerk reaction was that, what do you know about music? You know, you don't know anything, you're not a creative person and what not. But then later on, you know, as I grew older, I started realizing that these people are not personally against me. They do not uh, hate my music. It's just that it's not working for them. So I started becoming sort of like a psychiatrist, you know, where I started trying to understand because sometimes what they say is not exactly what they want to happen or what they mean. So, you know, you have to sort of interpret it in a way uh, to figure out. And at the same time, you have to figure out what kind of criticism works for you or not. Because if you're making a bhajan, let's say, a heavy metal guy is going to come and tell you it's such a boring track, you know. Yeah. So you have to figure out, you have to sort of decipher as to what criticism works for you and what does not. But at the same time, one should not be a delusional person to think that if I make a piece of music, everybody's going to love it. True. So that was a learning that I had during my entire career of about 13 years doing more than 3,500 commercials. That, uh, that you know, that one number one is, of course, developing a thick skin. And second thing is that understanding uh, a person who does not, or having empathy for a person who does not like my music and trying to understand what is it that they do not like about my music and whether I need to cater to that person or not. So that was, uh, that was I think, uh, one learning. And of course, one constant learning is obviously, you know, that hard work can take you places because I can tell you this for sure, you know, like in Bangalore itself where I live, my home, of course, I'm there very little now, but my home town, I can name off the top of my head without even thinking, I can name 50 musicians who are more talented than me. And uh, if you have to count the whole of India, I, off the top of my head, I can name 150 musicians who had every single person who sat in this couch in front of you is more talented than me. But there are two things that, uh, that I've got that probably they do not have. One thing is that I do not believe anybody is more hardworking than me. I just do not believe that. Because I, I live, breathe, eat everything music and that's all that I do. And I'm constantly working, I barely sleep and I'm obsessed with what I do. And the second thing is that I know how to apply my music in the right way. Even though I've been working on commercials and I've been making music based on what somebody else has briefed me or based on somebody else's sensibilities and trying to understand what is going on in their head. My core competency is trying to figure out what is in my head and trying to uh, translate that into the language of music and communicating that to my audience. That is something that is my core competency because as I told you, right from a childhood, uh, I've always wanted to express myself through my music rather than try to uh, replicate what somebody else is doing. Uh, so that is something that I've got, I believe that is my strength. And uh, and yeah, and whatever lack of talent I have, I I compensate with these two things with so hard first, work. First thing, <laughs> only talented people say this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, second, you mentioned 13 years, you did 3,500 things. Yeah. If my maths is right, it's almost... Uh, it's almost more, sometimes more than one a day. So I'll explain to you how my schedule used to work during those days. So I would wake up at 7 o'clock in the morning. During those days, I would not do any gigs. Almost no gigs. Like in the whole year, probably I'd do about maybe about 4 or 5 gigs in the whole year. So I was a studio rat. So what I was doing is that I would wake up in the morning at 7. I would get a brief from a client, usually in India or in Singapore or in Thailand. I would get a brief. I would finish off. I would wrap that up by 2 o'clock. And it was almost like a factory that I was working. What I would do is that when I would get the brief, even before I'd start the composition, I would already call up the musicians who I knew that I would uh, need for this particular uh, commercial. And I would tell them that be ready or come to the studio at this particular time uh, because the composition will be ready by that time. I would deliver that usually by about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon and it would be fully delivered. Then after that, uh, I would get a brief from somebody in Europe, either in Germany or in France, because those were the two big jingle production houses that I was working with that brief would get over by about 10 o'clock at night. And then 10 o'clock at night, I would get a brief from somebody in Los Angeles. And that brief would, uh, I would deliver it by about 2, 3 o'clock at night, sleep for about 3 or 4 hours and then start the cycle again. So that is how I was working. So sometimes it would be 3 commercials a day, sometimes it would be 1 commercial a day, but never less than 1. <laughs> and you mentioned uh, you were working for <coughs> companies in Europe, Los yeah. Angeles. 
Uh, how did that? How does that work? I mean, so it, it, I've uh, I've had a career where a lot of things have fallen into my lap. Uh, like uh, the first ever concert that I did, uh, I used to be in a rock band in India, in Bangalore. Angel Dust. A, a band called Angel Dust. We traveled across India. We won a whole lot of competitions and progressive rock band. And uh, then I wanted to, uh, I had this project idea with a drum machine and a keyboard and with vocal uh, synthesizers and things like that, like a one man show, you know, like sort of like an EDM, Indian fusion, classical type, uh, you know, project. So what I did was that uh, there's this uh, there's this event agency which all of us know, Viscraft. So their office was just about two streets away from my street, and somebody told me that they do events, and why didn't you get in touch with them? And I was must have been about 18 years at that time. So I just walked up to their office. There were a bunch of people standing outside the office. I told them, why didn't you come home and I'll show you some of my music? So all of them came home. I played them my music, the one man show with some big speakers and loud music, and then they uh, immediately said that day after tomorrow. We've got this corporate gig. Why don't you play over there? So I did that, and then that's what started off my career of doing those kind of solo gigs. And then over there, one of the guys from Viscraft tells me that, you know, you've got a computer, you've got all of that stuff. Can you record stuff? Can you record like a commercial for us? Uh, there is this brand, a motorcycle brand, that we need to do a commercial for. Can you record that? I said, yeah, but I said that uh, is the client going to come for it? They said, yeah. And I said that, but everything's in my bedroom. So will it be okay? We'll manage that. So then they bring the agency was Densu Communications. So they brought the agency head, and the agency head walks up the stairs in my house, walks straight into my bedroom, sits down on my bed, and I'm sitting on the bed. And two three people from Viscraft are there, and they're sitting down over there. And the agency head, she was furious. She was furious. She's like, "What am I doing over here? You know, this is a kid's like you know bedroom that I'm sitting in, and this is like a huge brand, and we are creating it." And then. The guys from Viscraft said that chill. Uh, at the most, like you know, you wasted a day, but just uh, hear the output, and they loved it at the end of it. And then they had other brands like Toyota. They had other brands like uh, Canon and Honda and DHL. So I started working on those brands. Now, as you know, sometimes a brand has got business in multiple agencies. So those brands started branching out, and they gave me work on their other agencies. And then Dentsu started giving me work in their uh, in the Japanese uh, branch. And then those people were working at jingle production houses in France. So then they said that no, you have to work with this guy in India. He'll do it for cheap, <laughs> and, and he'll deliver it fast, and he'll deliver it quickly. So then, and this guy does not do gigs. He does not travel. So he's reliable. Even after like ten months, or even after a year, he will still have the project, and he'll make changes for you. So he's a very reliable guy. Work with him. So that's how it happened. And then after that, then it moved to Los Angeles, and then. And then there were these people who just trusted me implicitly, and they would constantly uh, give me work. It's amazing to hear this because uh, with uh, this conversation, you can simply you know realize that uh, whenever you see an opportunity, you just have to take a step. Absolutely, you and just have to take it. That's all. You just have to take it and figure out how to do it. You know. And most of your jingles you've done for the international brands, right? It's mostly international, but I've also done the local sari shops and. I've done all of that too. I've done that, and uh, you know, local sports stores, and uh, you know, stuff for radio. Um, I've done all of that. Yeah. Any jingle you remember? <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but I've done. Uh, I've uh, I've done lots. Like for McDonald's for USA, I've done so many jingles for them for the US markets, and I've done uh, uh, tons of jingles for all of these brands. Like you know, the Pepsi, Coca Cola, every brand and their competitor, like in different parts of the world. I've done lots of them. And I have a lot of terms which I want to understand from you. Yeah. Uh, so you worked with United Nations General Assembly. Correct. Uh, in quite a lot of different ways. Correct. So what does each of that thing means? Uh, the UN Goodwill Ambassador. What What do you have to do? What exactly uh, is this thing? So the United Nations recognized that I was doing a lot of work in this particular uh, in in the fields that you know that they find really important. So it was a natural collaboration. So I'll just break down exactly what I do with the United Nations. So one is basically the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. It's known as the UNCCD. CCD. So they work uh, towards uh, uh, towards ensuring that land remains fertile, and uh, you know, and to prevent desertification because uh, because land provides the livelihood of a large, a vast majority of people, whether it's farming or whatever it is, and uh, and also uh, fertile land. 
is the best way to mitigate the effects of, uh, of uh, climate change. Because fertile land has got very good carbon capturing capacity. And plus fertile land, you can grow stuff, you can grow trees and all of that. And, you know, and that helps in, uh, in uh, reducing pollution and alleviating the effects of climate change. So I work very closely with the UNCCD. The second agency is the UNHCR, that is the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. So I work on the refugee crisis. I work on uh, making the lives of refugees better, especially musician refugees. Now, a lot of, uh, like for example, if you look at a country like Afghanistan, there are a lot of refugees from Afghanistan who are amazing musicians and they've been forced to leave their country, sometimes under dire circumstances, sometimes just with the clothes on their back because they're just fearful that, you know, that they'll be killed by the regime at uh, any given point of time. So uh, a lot of them come into India. India has welcomed a whole lot of Afghan refugees. So I work with these musicians because unfortunately they cannot carry on with their career because they sing in a language uh, which is not uh, mainstream in India. And the second thing is that they're busy surviving, you know, rather than, uh, you know, rather than thriving. I, I so, remember last year, in fact, you did a track with... Uh, with a person called uh, Abhi K. Safa, Abdullah Safa. So he wrote this beautiful song, uh, which I produced for him, a song called Farda. So Farda means tomorrow in, uh, in, uh, in Pashto. So the song goes, uh, a rough translation of the song Farda is that tomorrow, that is Farda, uh, when I die and my body turns cold, then take all of my music, my music sheets and burn it so that at least then it'll serve the purpose of keeping my grave warm. Because while I was living, you never allowed me to express myself through my music. It is such a beautiful song. And uh, so what I do is that I take Abhi K. Safa all over the world and, you know, and I get him to sing the song with me on stage. And the, the, trust me, not a dry eye in the audience. And that's the power of music because you talk about the refugee crisis, it's not going to affect people on a visceral level. But then when you sing a song about it, which is so beautiful as a song, Farda, that he's written, it, 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 it has an emotional moment on people because with all the problems that we face on a planet, whether it's environmental problems, whether it's social problems or whether it is um, ecological problems or problems of education or gender, uh, I believe that the biggest threat to us is the constant thought that we have that somebody else will make a difference. We're always waiting for government to make a difference, intergovernmental bodies and uh, politicians to make a difference, when the truth is that the only way we can bring about meaningful change is if we change ourselves. And the catalyst to do that is music, in my opinion. What is needed is for musicians to take all of these complex ideas and thoughts and to convert that through the emotional language of songwriting and storytelling through music. And that will hit the hearts and souls of people. It will hit people in the heart. And that is what will bring about change, in my opinion. So that's what musicians need to do. We need to use our uh, power of, you know, of communicating to people and emotionally reaching out to people and uh, use that to bring about positive change in this world. Yes, in fact. And you also represent UNESCO for the, as the kindness Global ambassador. ambassador of Kindness. So that's the other thing that I do. I work with UNESCO MGIP and I'm the Global Ambassador for Kindness because with all of these problems, again, that I mentioned, if you're just kind to everybody around us, kind to all species, because that's what Vasudeva Kutumbakam teaches us, you know, the, that the world is one family. When we think about the world as one family, the only thing we think about is, you know, living in peace between all of us human beings. But we are not the only species on this planet. So Vasudeva Kutumbakam has always meant that you have to be kind and you have to live in peace and harmony with not just human beings, but with all animals, plants, forests, wildlife. And not only that, with also the elements of nature, the water we drink, the air we breathe, the land we walk on. And only if we practice this true Vasudeva Kutumbakam and kindness with everything, that, you know, the, the human species will survive. Because that's the only way that, you know, all of these problems will be mitigated. Then I also work with the WHO. WHO, I work with them on their air pollution campaign. That is the World Health Organization. Became very famous during COVID. <laughs> and uh, the second thing that I do with them is something which will interest you. It's uh, the Make Listening Safe Initiative. So for those who are watching your podcast or listening to your podcast, uh, um, especially the musicians, uh, the WHO has done research and they figured out that 1.1 billion young people are at a risk of hearing loss because of the way they listen to music. 1.1 billion. 1.1 billion. So that is basically people who listen to music on headphones or earphones or on listening devices and also people who go to concerts. So what we've done is that we've come up with recommendations. Uh, recommendations for listening devices, which a lot of companies like Apple and others have taken up already. Samsung also has taken up. And uh, the second thing is about concert venues. So we've got recommendations for concert venues for even distribution of sound. 
So the recommendations is not against music. The recommendations is not uh, against. It's not about bringing down the volume of music. It's about even distribution of sound because you would have experienced this that sometimes when you go to these concerts, the volume is super loud in the super first nice. few uh, first few rows, and people at the back are complaining that it's very soft. So everything is about even distribution of sound. So there has to be options to the audience where you know you give like proper attenuated earplugs, earplugs that are high quality, which. Uh, reduce frequencies across the frequency spectrum, not like the foam ones, but good quality uh, earplugs, so that uh, so that the concert goer can sit down and still enjoy the concert, and at the same time, you know, protect the hearing and it does not hurt them. Because when hearing loss goes, like for example, if you have like a degree of hearing loss, like five percent to ten percent, that never comes back. There is no cure for it. So that is why we all need to protect our hearings, especially musicians. We need to take this very very seriously. This is a really really. Good initiative, and I think more and more people should get educated about this. So we will not promote this separately as well. <laughs> you also work with UNICEF, and you also created, I think, twenty-seven rhymes. Oh yeah. <laughs> so basically, if you want to create a more environmentally conscious society, then you have to start with the children. There is no two ways about it. And I realized this a couple of years ago, around two thousand seventeen, is when I realized that why am I not doing anything with children? You know. So then, uh, with two friends of mine, Dominic De Cruz and another friend of mine from New York, Lonnie Park, the three of us got together and we wrote these twenty-seven rhymes. And these rhymes are sort of adolescent rhymes from uh, uh, from ages of like you know grade one to grade eight. Uh, and each rhyme is about a different topic. One rhyme is about sharing. Another rhyme is about teaching children what a carbon footprint is. Uh, another song is about the rhinoceros. Another one is about the elephant. Another one is about teaching children about. Uh, the ill effects of single-use plastics and things like that, but all of them are positive. All of them are happy. All of them are energetic. They are fun, and the biggest, the most toughest challenge for me while making these songs was not to add any complications to the music, because being a musician, you want to add all these complex right. chords and these ideas. But I had to constantly make sure that it was extremely simple, so that a child can listen to it once and they immediately memorize it. So currently, we are in. I think we have crossed about 20 million textbooks across India and different parts of the world in English. Uh, we've got Hindi versions, which are going to be rolled out very soon, and we've got Kannada versions and even Odia versions, which are going to be rolling out very soon. So the idea is that to start the conversation on conservation and on sustainability at an early age with children, because I've always believed that children are born with beautiful qualities like environmental consciousness, kindness, empathy, compassion, love for nature. But the way that we are bringing up our children. And the way we've built our systems around us, we're systematically erasing it from our children. True, sure. you know. So that's what we are doing because they are born with all it. No child is born with racism. No child is born with hatred. Every child is born with love. But then we are just erasing that. We're erasing those instincts from children. So my so that's what I tell people that these songs are an effort not to teach children these things, but to keep these qualities within our children. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing these things in details. Yeah. I think the list is too long. <laughs> uh, I would request uh, the audiences to please go to his Wikipedia and his website <laughs> and uh, go through the list of achievements he has, uh, the list of organizations he works with, list of awards he's got. Uh, I'm guaranteeing you, you'll be amazed and you'll be really, really happy as an Indian and as a part of the music industry that somebody from us has been able to achieve so much. <laughs> uh, uh, if you look at your life uh, apart from learnings, so what has been the most funniest incident? <laughs> Now, of course, a lot of funny incidents happened uh, during the time when I was making commercials. <laughs> like I had this uh, client walk into the studio once and tell me that uh, uh, you know that uh, this jingle it needs to have more energy. Have you heard that song "Who the F is Alice" by Pink Floyd? You know, so we have that kind of stuff. Or one client did once come to me. You know, the, this tune has to sound like a mix of uh, you know a piano and a tube light. <laughs> 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 so, so we have. So, of course, there were a lot of funny incidents that happened uh, uh, during that time. But uh, I guess, like you know, as you know, like you know, when you're doing that many concerts, and of course, for the last uh, uh, seven, eight years, I've done uh, lots and lots of concerts. There are always uh, incidents which now are funny, but during the time when they happened, they were very stressful. <laughs> so I've had a lot of those incidents, and of course, I'm not a very good person to talk to during my sound checks because. Um, sound checks are like the worst times for me because I'm always extremely anxious and stressed because there are so many things that can go wrong and you know and things like that. So I'm not a very good human being during my <laughs> sound checks. <laughs> <laughs> and what had been the most embarrassing moment? Embarrassing. 
<laughs> Let me think uh, the Okay, uh, I hate admitting this, but this happened actually with the with the uh, what do you call that? Uh, it, 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 all our concerts we always end with the Indian national anthem. I've done a special version of the Indian national anthem, yes. so we ended with the that. Uh, Grand Philharmonic. With the Philharmonic. So this particular concert that we did, we uh, 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 <laughs> I can't believe I'm talking about it, but uh, the thing is that so we basically uh, played it, and like all. Uh, uh, you know, like most, uh, perf- uh, uh, I mean, that uh, shows we've uh, we've got backing tracks for our concerts. You know, so so we've got a click track going on. So that is why there's very little room for error. You know, when these things happen, so we ended our concert like how we've ended, like you know, maybe about 600 concerts before that we've ended with the we ended with the national anthem, and then we are playing the national anthem, and what happens is the flute player. Uh, messes up in between. Oh, okay, so he he skipped one line and everything went out of whack. Obviously. And then the singer on stage was not singing, but the singer had the microphone because it was an instrumental version. So she felt that all right, you know, like uh, you know, I'll try to correct him, you know, and I'll try to get him on to the right place. And she sings that part of the national anthem one bar late. Okay, oh. so it was, and I'm on my keyboards and I'm playing, and I don't know who to follow on my keyboards. And then it ends, you know, where the tra- where the where the click track it ends with jaya hai, jaya hai, jaya 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 hai. and then after that the singer goes jaya 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 hai. then the flute player goes jaya jaya jaya, jaya. <laughs> and then usually at the end of the concert all of us go in front and then we take a bow so that what I just said thank you and I walked off stage <laughs> because there are a lot of roles when you play a national anthem correct 52 seconds and yeah, 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 yeah. Things. but I, I did people understand I think nobody, people must have thought nobody it, knew anything was wrong yeah people must have thought it's improvisation nobody knew anything was wrong it everybody just enjoyed it so that was the thing but anyway for me it was quite an embarrassing situation <laughs> and what would uh, you say will be the was your most difficult decision Difficult decision. Uh, I was very, very clear in my head that I wanted to be a professional musician. There was no two ways about it. And my family also, my father and mother knew that, you know, that I'm obsessed with music and, you know, he's going to be doing something with music. But my parents never imagined that I wanted to do it as a profession for some reason. You know, they always thought that, okay, he's going to continue doing music, you know, whatever. But uh, he'll become a doctor or because my dad's a third generation doctor. So when I articulated it to my father, uh, you know, in my 12th that, you know, that I want to Become a professional musician. He was shocked because he never realized that music can actually be a profession. So he said that, yeah, of course you can do music, but what are you going to do? You know, like what is going to be a profession? You'll have to become a doctor, or you'll have to become an engineer, or something like that. And I told him, no, I'm going to make money through music, and I'm only going to be doing music. And he was furious. So the decision, I think that was the toughest decision that I made in my life, where I had to follow what my dad said, and I had to finish off a degree in dental surgery. I think that was very difficult because my father made a deal with me that, or rather, we both made a deal with each other that I would finish off that degree of dental surgery, and once I get that degree in my hand, then my life is my own, and my father will never question me again for the rest of my life. But I did uh, at the end of five years, as I say, that I did not know anything in dentistry, but I got a degree, and <laughs> so I, so I went to my father and very ceremoniously I gave him the degree certificate and I told him that this is for you. I'm not going to practice even for a single day. And dentistry is a very noble profession, uh, but it's not for me. So, and he completely understood by then. Uh, but you know, surprisingly, this whole thing about you know children not taking up a career in the arts—it's not an India problem. It, it is all over the world uh, because I've seen that happening with my American friends also, uh, the, with my European friends. All of them have the same problem. It's just that over there, the college system for uh, like conservatory system where there is infrastructure for a kid to get a degree in music so they go to this university like juilliards or you know or uh, uh, what do you call that uh, or boston conservatory or berkeley which is a proper structured university with proper infrastructure and professors and all of that stuff so that gives confidence to parents at times because a parent taking the kid to that place and seeing that oh there are so many yeah. like minded kids and obviously you know there is some career prospects uh, if like you know if they've got such a huge College building and they're giving out degrees in music. That does not exist in India. That is the problem. That infrastructure. Uh, I think that's slowly, slowly happening with KM Conservatory and correct, correct. A few uh, other. Even I'm them. also starting one in Bangalore. So uh, the, uh, uh, where we're going to be awarding degrees in in music and the performing arts and creative arts. So I guess it, everybody needs to work together to build that infrastructure because it's not just the infrastructure. 
it uh, when it comes to education but also performance venues uh, there needs to be more professional performance venues in india which is plug and play you know because that exists everywhere else in the world but in india we don't have that where you go in where you go into a hall and you don't need to hire anything you know everything is I just i remember we went to london uh, a couple of year, few years back and we were looking for a studio for yourself yeah and there are these studios uh, where there is nobody yeah and everything is online correct you just pay online correct select the studio go there they give you a code you press the code you enter and there are like musicians in every room and there are multiple students and you can amazing. record over there you go, what do you call it you can record your entire jam session you can do all of that it's amazing, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. so the infrastructure over there exists it's it's not just the education it's education it is performance spaces and it is jobs because if you look at new york for example or even london or other places uh, musicians have got there are orchestras symphony orchestras there are broadway plays so musicians have got 9 to 5 type jobs over there you know where you can you can work like 6 days a week or 7 days a week in one of these broadway plays or with an orchestra and all of this stuff and make a salary uh, you can have jobs in studios and you can make a salary so those so basically uh, it's not like a musician has to be a super successful musician or a struggling musician there are places in between when it comes to uh, when it comes to foreign countries so that even though in india it's starting and it's sort of developing it needs to develop much much more further and when in your entire career you've been doing so many things didn't bollywood ever excite you or didn't you try to do something in bollywood i love uh, watching bollywood movies i love bollywood songs but then it comes to that same uh, issue that i spoke about you know that uh, for me i wanted to express myself through my music now when it came to jingles uh, there was an advantage of working on jingles number one is that uh, that jingles is not a credited medium so your name and your personality is not attached to a jingle correct so that was something that was very enticing for me that uh, you know that uh, so for me i was looking at jingles as being more of a workout uh, it was the best music education that i could possibly get simply because you're working on something different every day like yesterday i would have worked on let's say a tamil folk jingle today i work on a celtic jingle tomorrow it's a hip hop and then the day after that it's a heavy metal jingle so you're keeping yourself on your toes with all these different forms of music and you're understanding the good music and the bad music and how to create this kind of music and how to work with musicians within these various genres of music and uh, so and just like a workout where uh, you go to the gym the more you go to a gym the better you get at it True. Uh, it i believe it's the same thing with composition that uh, the more you compose the better you get at it the easier composition comes to you and that is why my music does not have much of a genre it's like a mix bag of various styles of music because of my jingle career whereas when it comes to the film industry your name is attached to something and I believe that a lot of musicians are making music that they themselves do not listen to. Like for example, without taking names but all the top music yeah, directors yeah. when they are making uh when they're making let's say an item song or they're making something like a party song or whatever, I do not imagine them sitting down at home and listening to that music themselves because they listen to a completely different kind of music. It's a part of a storytelling. It's part of storytelling and yeah. it's a job, you know? Yeah. So that is the way it is. It's about thing. But while I believe that you need to be extremely talented to do that. you know and there are some people who i truly look up to you know like for example vishal shekhar i think they are amazing my favorites uh, salim suleiman and of course shankar ehsan loy and so many pritham uh, or amit yeah, trivedi yeah. they're just brilliant at what they do but that is something that i know i will not be brilliant at and are you open to working with uh, labels in india of course uh, for non film projects i would love to do that and i have approached a lot of them but none of them have responded to me i think it's <laughs> it should have been the other way around <laughs> now i constantly i have absolutely no shame about approaching people i have no shame about uh talking to people asking for opportunities and i do that all the time whenever i meet a person from a label i'm like we have to work with each other i send them a follow up email but for some reason i never get a response so let me do the tough discussion <laughs> on behalf of all the labels okay <laughs> you know so if let's say if if a label wants to invest in your music yeah uh, would you be open to do anything apart from the environmental uh, you know the purpose which you have through your music of course i would love to i would love to but the thing is that uh, at the same time it cannot be uh, Uh, it cannot be something that is too far away from my sensibilities like for example if it is if it's a love song or something like that then that's something that i would not like to do unless it is deeply rooted within indian culture so like i recently did an album with this amazing canadian indian singer a guy called abhi v uh, i did this album called arambh uh, each song featured a different uh, singer along with him and he's such an amazing carnatic classical and hindustani carnatic classical by training but also a hindustani classical singer one of the most trained singers that i've ever heard and 
What I liked so much about him is that he's a singer who has been born and brought up in uh, Canada, but yet he's kept his Indian traditions absolutely intact uh, in terms of his singing style. So I did this album with him. Again, all the songs are are romantic and love songs. But at the same time, what I did was that I composed the entire album in a very Tumri style, like Tumri and Bandish style. And uh, that with a lot fused with a lot of electronica. So that was something that was exciting for me because it was deeply rooted within tradition. Because that is also a form of conservation. So, you know, uh, labels only say one thing. They don't have any genres. They are businessmen. Correct. Uh, they would love to invest on anything that works. Yeah, obviously, obviously. So, and I totally appreciate that. So if, let's assume, a label is investing X amount of money. Yeah. Uh, the first song or the first project, they might take a risk. Yes, yes. But eventually, if that doesn't yeah. make them money, uh, it doesn't work for Correct. them. Correct. So maybe there might be a style yeah. in which you don't have to compromise. Yes. But it can still be commercially viable to them. I think that's where you know the thing will work. No, true. I, I mean, I would absolutely love that. But because, I'm happy with uh, the fact you're open to it. No, because I've figured out what is commercially right. viable outside of India. Hmm. And I've been quite successful at doing true. that. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would love... Uh, to be more, uh, I would love my, rather I'd love my music to be more recognized in India. And that is something that I would really love to. There are a lot of young labels coming now. I yeah. mean, there are top labels for sure. But there are a lot of labels yeah. now and a lot of artists doing themselves. And Correct. So, wishing you all the best. I'm happy that you're open. Yeah, hopefully people will listen to this and they will approach me now. <laughs> <laughs> now that you've endorsed me. Now <laughs> no, no, of course, there, yeah. there should be every kind of music. Yeah. I mean, I'm a firm believer of that. No, I agree with you. I agree with you on that. Fortunately, India is a huge country. Yeah, yeah. There's so many of us. Correct. In so, India, outside India. No, that's what, so that one size fits all approach should not be the, Correct. Uh, should not be the paradigm by which record labels work. True. And that's what I always believe that, you know, that uh, record labels need to move away from this whole one size fits all approach and try to look at, uh, look at diversifying. I'll give you an example. Now, in America, let's say, uh, you've got, uh, you've got, uh, let's say an artist like Taylor Swift, okay? Taylor Swift, uh, she's won how many about like 12 or 13 Grammy Awards. And uh, she is right now the biggest star internationally. She must be having, I think, I do not know how many Instagram followers, maybe about 250 million or 200 million Instagram followers. Now you have a person who's the late Chick Korea. Okay, Chick Korea must be having about 250,000 Instagram followers. Like, you know, not even about maybe a quarter million Instagram followers. And he's got about 26 Grammy Awards and he's said to be one of the greatest musicians in the history of music. Now, both of their definitions of success is different. Very different, yes. It's very, very different. If you look at it, if, 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 that, if these two people, if these two great people existed in India and uh, somebody went to Chikoria and said that, Are, you've got uh, 26 Grammy Awards and you're such a good musician. Why do you have only 250,000 <laughs> followers, you know? Why is it like that? And, but in America, people understand that True. he's got a loyal audience and he's got that niche audience and he's happy with that audience. He does not want to have, his music is not a one-size-fits-all approach. True. Whereas Taylor Swift's music is a one-size-fits-all approach where it, it, it caters to a huge demographic and a wide demographic across ages, across cultures, across uh, geographic boundaries. Whereas Chikuria only appeals to hardcore uh, music lovers and to, uh, and to jazz music listeners. Why can't we have that in India? Where people are happy with a niche audience and at the same time are able to make a living catering to the niche audience and not constantly thinking that, oh, I should get 1 million followers or I should get 2 million followers. Just have those loyal followers and cater to those musicians and really nurture that audience. True. Actually, it's food for thought. It's a conversation which uh, which we can have yeah. for a very long time. Of course. Uh, and you do, you do so many things. So you must be having a large team. <laughs> <laughs> not a very large team. I've got a, I've got a 10 member team. Would you like to share who does what? So yeah, so basically uh, got uh, some people who, uh, some of them work with me on my music, like engineers and programmers. And uh, one of them sort of like uh, is my chief of uh, staff, you know, who handles everything. Then I've got one person who helps me out with my video editing and uh, with my coordination and logistics. So everybody's got their own roles. But as you know, in an organization like mine, which is a smaller organization, everybody ends up uh, doing, doing everything, everything, you know, so. See, you know, when you mentioned about your team, 10 people team. Yeah. You'll be surprised to note that less than 100 artists or 50 artists in this country will have a 10 member team. Mm. No, because I, as I told you, I do not have team. management and all of that. So, so everything happens internally. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess uh, that's the reason why for me it becomes essential because of the amount of traveling that I do. Like last year, 
the total number of concerts that I did was 17, uh, sorry, uh, 77 concerts in 17 countries. 77 concerts. In 17 countries. So that's the amount of traveling uh, that I do. December itself was five countries. So January was three countries. Pretty organized, hands so on. So it has to be. because, And also the thing is that I do not have uh, the same band that plays everywhere. So for me, yeah. I even though it is stepping on my own foot, what I prefer to do is that I prefer to have a pool of musicians. And, uh, and uh, I encourage my musicians to play with other musicians because then they bring in all their learnings into our concerts. Because if, if I'm working with the same set of musicians and they're only working with me, uh, then I realize that they start stagnating. So that's why I've got a pool of musicians. Like I've got multiple flute players, multiple percussion players, multiple singers. And what we do is that whoever is available and we try to shuffle it around and we work with different musicians. And of course, I've got musicians in Europe. I've got musicians in America, uh, musicians in Southeast Asia that when I go to those countries, I can, you know, I can work with them too. And last, let's talk a little bit about your live concert. What does a, how does a, gen, a standard Ricky Cage concert look like? I mean, so What's in there? visuals play a very important role in our concert. So I forgot to mention in the 10 people, two people are people who just work with, uh, work on visuals. One of them travels around the world and he films uh, visuals okay. everywhere. So the coming back to the concert, so we've got some amazing virtuoso musicians. Every musician, as I mentioned previously, is better than me. So it's me on a bunch of keyboards, electronics, triggering stuff, playing keyboards, all of that stuff and, uh, and announcing the songs. And uh, we've got like a, a brilliant flute player, brilliant sitar player. We've got two brilliant percussion players. We've got a guy uh, from New York, a guy called uh, Keith Middleton, who's from the Broadway group Stomp. So which uh, which makes percussion out of everyday uh, objects like garbage cans and things like that. So we've got him. We've got, uh, we usually have, uh, uh, at least the concerts abroad usually has either a string section or at least a string quartet, which is local. In India, now we've started doing that. We've found some really good strings players and we've started working with orchestras in India. And uh, we've got some brilliant uh, singers. So that's basically what it is. So a large backdrop screen, which has got visuals and not just visualizations, but actual narratives. The content is mainly English. Which one? The, the songs? No, no, it's actually a mix of various languages. In India, it's, I would say it is about, um, I would say about 70% Hindi, uh, about uh, maybe about 10% English and the rest of it is in Sanskrit. Sanskrit is Yeah. It? And, uh, uh, but again, we also modify stuff. Like if you're performing in Karnataka, we do a few songs in Kannada. We do translations. If you're performing in Andhra Pradesh, we do a few songs in Telugu. So we do, uh, uh, we do modify uh, stuff based on where we are performing. Which uh, concert have been your best experience till now? In India, I would say that uh, my uh, favorite concert that I've ever done was in 2019. Uh, in, uh, ju in July, I played for 20 years of Kargil Divas for the army in, uh, in uh, Ladakh. Oh. So it was, uh, it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. Uh, 12,000 feet, uh, uh, you know, elevation. And uh, about, uh, I think it was about 13 or 14,000 army soldiers, all in uniform, uh, stand, sitting down in front of me. And a two-hour concert, uh, completely surrounded by mountains on all four sides. Shanti Stupa was my backdrop. And it was, uh, it was just an amazing experience. I think all over the world, performing at the UN General Assembly, I think the first time when I performed over there was extra special. Luckily, I got to do a rehearsal a day before the concert. So I could experience the hall. Otherwise, I would have felt very nervous because imagine just standing over there on that stage. And that is the same stage and the same room where every single treaty in this planet has been signed. Yes. Every single world leader has stood on that stage, you know, and given a speech. Every single war has been spoken about on that stage. And to actually play over there in those hallowed halls, it was amazing. And then, of course, after that, I did it three more times, so a total of four times. Uh, so it's it's uh, so that was uh, quite a uh, stunning uh, that was quite a stunning concert a great when, experience. When you just mentioned about uh, being in a place where the greatest of the things have happened. Yeah, uh, you've been in a lot of places like this. Yeah, uh, the Abbey Studio where you recorded the oh, song. Oh right, that was also quite an experience because for me the national anthem is sacrosanct. It's something that I absolutely adore, and as I mentioned earlier that uh, I end all of my concerts with the national anthem uh, because I just love that piece of music and. And anthems anywhere in the world, it also showcases the power of music. True. Because the, min the minute we listen to the first few notes of the Indian national anthem, across party lines, across ideologies, yeah, across, yeah. Uh, uh, across uh, philosophies, uh, we immediately have that sense of patriotism and that is the power of music. And that's why every country has got a national anthem because everybody understands the power of music to bring people together. So uh, I've made multiple versions of the national anthem in the past. And last year, 
I decided that I wanted to do it with the symphony orchestra. And I've worked with symphony orchestras all over the world, conducted symphony orchestras. I love working with symphony orchestras. And the reason why I wanted to work with the symphony orchestra for the Indian national anthem was this, that a symphony orchestra has got various instruments, like a violin, soft instrument, a timpani, loud instrument, percussion instrument. Then you have a harp, soft, mm -hmm. angelic instrument. You have a tuba, which is such a loud instrument that if somebody's playing it over here, you'll probably go deaf, you know, that's how loud it is. And you've got all of these instruments. Now, a violin is not trying to be a timpani. A timpani is not trying to be a harp. They're maintaining their own unique identity. Okay, everybody, all these instruments are maintaining their own unique identity and who they are. But somehow when everybody play together, they play together beautifully as one. And it sounds so amazing that it just comes together as one in beautiful harmony. And that is what India is all about. Correct. You drive 200 kilometers in any direction, you're going to find a different language, different culinary taste, preference, different ideology, sometimes different religion, all of that stuff. But somehow everything just works together. True. You know, and so that is why when we talk about oneness as a concept, which I use a lot in my uh, songs, you know, oneness is a very, very strong concept in my songs. It's in Buddhism, it's in Christianity, it's in Hinduism. The thing about oneness is not that everybody has to be uniform. It's never meant that. It is meant that everybody maintain your own unique identity, but somehow come together as one. True. You know, and come together in harmony, because that's what music is, right? That not everybody has to play a C note. Some people play a C note, some people play an E note, some people play a G note. And somehow all those three notes come together in beautiful harmony and it sounds beautiful. Because in unity, we have strength and that's what harmony is all about. So that is why I wanted to record with the symphony orchestra. My favorite symphony orchestra who I've collaborated with multiple times in the past is the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra in London. So I contacted them, told them, let's do a hundred piece orchestra. The only studio that can record a 100-piece orchestra is Abbey Road. I've recorded with them multiple times in the past. I told them, they're like, okay, let's do it. So then I went to Abbey Road, I recorded with the orchestra. And then while I was recording with them, I realized there's subtext over there. Because after having ruled us for 200 years, an Indian conductor is conducting the top orchestra in the UK, that is the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, and they're 100 of the finest musicians performing our Indian national anthem. <laughs> So somehow it struck a chord with everybody in India. And I remember when I put it out on Independence Day, the first person to retweet it was our Prime Minister. And he said that it should make every Indian proud. And and of course, like, you know, it just went completely viral after that. And uh, I'm really glad that I was able to gift this. And I've removed all copyright from the piece of music. I mean, from my recording. So I've gifted it to the nation that anybody can use it for whatever purposes they want without any permission. It's just given to everybody. And the best musicians in the world had been in that room. Yeah, and it, but the thing is that everybody else gets to watch it on the video. I was in that room when I heard a hundred piece orchestra actually perform the national anthem and to hear it over there, hear those hundred musicians play it. It was just unbelievable. It was such a beautiful experience. True. And let's talk about a little bit about your inspirations. Sure. Uh, what are the, what is the kind of music you listen to? I listen to a variety of music, a huge amount of music. Again, because of my jingle, my past life of being a jingle composer, so that's why I listen to a lot of music. If you look at my Spotify playlist, you know, which I, uh, which I compile for, you know, for the planes and all of that stuff, you'll find a bunch of songs from Panthera, you'll find songs from uh, Metallica, you'll find some Cannibal Corpse and Sepultura, Rammstein, you'll also find a bunch of jazz classics, you know, from Herbie Hancock, you'll find some stuff from Chikoria, yeah, lots of stuff from Chikoria rather, uh, also Stevie Wonder, and then uh, Soul R&B, then you also you'll find uh, uh, songs from uh, uh, the fighter. The what's the, uh, the what's the, what's the song? Uh, the Ishq Jaisa Kuch. Ishq Jaisa Kuch. I love that song. It's so good that song. Yeah. So yeah, so I, so the, the so that song's on the playlist. And then uh, I've got uh, uh, a bunch of Salim Suleiman songs that I love. A bunch of A R Rahman songs. So I've got a whole variety of stuff. Then I've got a whole lot of stuff from Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan, because I've always believed about. You know, this is something that is personal to me. Ustad Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan, if, uh, I believe that if God had a voice, it would be Ustad Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan's voice. That's what I believe. So yeah, so, uh, so a lot of his music is, uh, is uh, a part of uh, my uh, playlist. So inspiration, but my inspiration actually does not come from other music. Uh, my inspiration comes from uh, other medium, like, you know, nature. I go, I walk, I get into the forest very often. Uh, I'm in nature very often. And I believe that that is my inspiration because when you look at nature, there are, or rather, uh, because I'm just thinking aloud right now, uh, when you look at an art form like painting or, uh, you know, photography, the difference between both of them, 
if I'm taking a picture of you, like photography, and I click a picture, then based on the lighting conditions and based on how you're sitting and based on the moment, it'll be a verbatim uh, reflection of what I see in front of me in that uh, picture. But if I make a painting of you, then I can take a little bit of your personality and put it into the painting because it's it's open to a little bit more of interpretation. That's how I believe that I make music on nature, that I do not record sounds of nature and put it in my music, you know, like how a photograph would be. What I do is that I use instruments like the flute, like the sitar, like a, uh, like an accordion or like a guitar or an orchestra. And I interpret those sounds of nature uh, through the language of music and through notes. So that is basically my inspiration. Ricky, a personal compliment. Uh, the way you explain things, yeah. it's amazing. <laughs> you know, because uh, I haven't found too many musicians who are able to express their ideas and thoughts like this. <laughs> Sometimes you. you might have an idea, but you don't really know how to express that idea and convert it into words and, you know, uh, say it to the other person, but you're amazing in that. Ah, thank so, you. <laughs> congratulations. Uh, and uh, let's assume out of all the collaborations, you've done so many collaborations, which is the most favorite remembered collaborations? No, it has to be Stuart Copeland, for sure. So Stuart Copeland uh, is the famous drummer. For those of you, uh, for those of your audience who does not know him, he basically uh, was the founder and drummer police. of the police. Yeah. He's the one who auditioned Sting into the band and uh, uh, said to be the greatest drummer in the history of music and uh, also composed 50 Hollywood movie soundtracks. One of the greatest legends ever in music. So what happened with that collaboration, and I'll probably take about a minute or two to explain about that. So I have uh, I grew up with pictures of him on my wall, with his posters on my wall and all of that stuff. I was, I absolutely loved that guy and loved his music and loved his style of drumming. And then what happened was that uh, uh, I wanted to make a follow-up to my 2015 Grammy Award winning album that is Winds of Samsara. But my touring schedule had become so relentless that I could not sit down in a very focused manner in the studio and actually create music. But the pandemic hit in 2020. So I was forced to stay indoors. And I started making the first pieces of music that would go on to becoming Divine Tides. And uh, I made a couple of small, small pieces of music. And I thought I need a collaborator for this because I need somebody to take this from, uh, from, uh, from this level to that level. And I thought, why not reach out to Stuart Copeland, you know? So I actually contacted Ralph Simon, a common friend of ours. And I asked Ralph that, uh, Ralph, do you know uh, Stuart? He's like, no, but I know his manager. So let's get in touch with him. So Ralph uh, contacted the manager. Manager sent the pieces of music to Stuart. In a week, I got a call from Stuart. He's like, let's do this. And then I was like, wow. So that's the thing, you know, but we talked about opportunities. If you don't take the opportunity, yeah, you're never so going to say know. that, you know, again, it's just one step you have to take Correct. and you see it, yeah. At the most, you'll get rejected, you know, but why fear rejection? <clears throat> so I, uh, so then we worked on the album for a year after that. It was one of the most, the most enjoyable experience musically for me ever. It was like a masterclass for me. So up until then, I've always been in control of my music. You know, I'm the person who makes decisions. And of course, like, you know, there, there are times like the business people make decisions. But for me, I was the guy who was the creative person in charge. Now I've got a collaborator who's above me, you know, much, much above me. So what I decided is that I decided that I'm going to stick to this rule that if he asks me to do something, I will just do it. And no, even if I feel that it is completely wrong, that this is not going to work, even then I'm going to shut up and I'm just going to do it. And I'm going to live with it for two weeks. And at the end of two weeks, if I still feel that he's wrong, then I will voice my opinion. And during that entire one year, there must have been about 20 to 30 times where you know, I felt that, oh, this is not going to work. What he's asking me to do is ridiculous. Or that drum line that he played, it's just not working. You know, let's do something else or whatever. But I would shut up and I would keep it for two weeks. And at the end of two weeks, I would be like, wow, I'm so lucky that I did not do what I wanted to do. Because you start falling in love with your own ideas. And you start, uh, you, you get so uh, myopic with it, you know, that you just fall in love with your own ideas that you don't uh, look at things from a different perspective. But when you live with that perspective, you start realizing that that is the correct way to go. And that is the genius of uh, Stuart. We became really, really close. We, um, you know, uh, like, like an older brother, like a father figure to me, because he's got children who are older than me. We became really close, like hundreds of phone calls, hundreds of Zoom calls, messages every day, emails every day. We, that's how close we became. And then I, uh, we, the album becomes very successful. Album uh, goes all over the world. It, again, it goes number one on radio, all of that stuff. And I've not even met him. And then we get nominated for a Grammy. And I've still not met him ever in person, in person. That is the <clears throat> pandemic, right? And then, um, 
seven days before the Grammys, I go to uh, Nashville because he's got a concert over there. And we thought that we'll catch up in Nashville and then go for the Grammys together. So I caught up with him. I watched his concert. And then I went uh, to the after party and over there for the first time, I actually, you know, hugged him. You know, like uh, met him in person and hugged him. And, you know, I feel like crying right now when I'm even thinking about it, you know. But the thing is that like that hug was so beautiful because it was almost like we've gone through that whole pandemic together, you know. And uh, I was having a lot of personal problems during that time. And he was also like, you know, he was very important for me at that time. So, yeah, so then we went for the Grammys and, you know, and we even shared a room. Uh, at the hotel, you know, when we were getting ready and all of that stuff. And then, as they say, the rest is history. So, uh, one more thing that I'll tell you, which you might find interesting is that the Grammys, they have this thing that, uh, you know, that when you win the award in, in the past, you get two minutes to give an acceptance speech. So, during the two minutes, if you've got five people in the band, all five people can talk, two people can talk. But at two minutes, they're going to shut off your mic and they're going to start playing the music. That year, they sent a memo to everybody saying that it's 45 seconds. And only one person. And can. only one person can talk. That's yeah. it. Only one person. If a second person, if you, if one person has talked for 15 seconds and a second person comes on, they're going to shut off the mic. So it's only one person. So I immediately throw Stuart, you have to talk. Stuart said, no, no, you have to talk. I saw that speech. Yeah. And then, and then uh, I told Stuart that, you know, Stuart, it'd be better if you praise me rather than I praise myself. <laughs> so it'll be, and you're the legend. So, you know, you talk. So he said, all right. So we go up on stage. Now, while we, of course, we were called out as the winners. It was an exhilarating experience. Both of us jumped up, went up on stage. And then he realized that the conductor of the orchestra was somebody he knew. The person who would play us off, na? stage. So he immediately, so basically he goes up on the mic. He gives a very quick, and if you see that on YouTube, like you've yeah. seen it, he gives a very quick joke, a drummer joke. And then he tells that, you know, that this album is all about Ricky. So Ricky, come yes. in front of the mic. And then he looks at the conductor Correct. and he tells him, don't you dare, you know. <laughs> and he tells me, he, and I'm That's not talking because I'm scared they'll start playing the music. And then, and then Stuart says, Ricky, start speaking. So I start speaking and then I give the speech. And throughout the speech, you can see on the YouTube video, he's looking at, because I could not see him at that time. And I looked at the YouTube video, he's constantly looking at the conductor. He's like this, don't, don't start, don't start. <laughs> and then I give my whole speech and then he looks at the conductor. He's like, okay, go ahead. And then we go out. So that is, that is what legends are made of, you know, that, that he could have easily taken that 45 seconds. He sure. could have spoken. He could have done whatever he wanted. I wanted him to speak. But then he decided that there's this young guy over here. There is this guy who, you know, like I like a lot, like he, that is he likes a lot. Let him, you know, let's give him his chance, you know, to speak. So that's what it is. So I'm, a real experience. I've just finished off another, uh, now I've just finished off my third album with him, finished recording it. So that album hopefully will come out by the end of this year. We wish that gets a Grammy too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, is there any artist uh, you're dreaming of to collaborate with? There's a dream collaboration. Lots of Indian artists actually. Lots of uh, lots of Indian artists that I would love to collaborate with. See, I can promise you, uh, can't uh, say it officially yet. Uh, there was one artist who came to the podcast. Uh, he shared what he wants to do. A few days later, their collaboration has started. Wow. <laughs> uh, so you should say who you want to collaborate with. Now, of course, you know it. I've always wanted to collaborate with Arijit Singh. Like, and there was one conversation which happened also. There was a conversation that happened, but uh, yeah, I did not go further. But he's one person who I would love to collaborate with. Uh, Arman Malik and me are very close friends, actually. So hopefully I'll get to collaborate with him. Uh, Shankar Mahadevan, I all I love collaborating with him. I collaborated with him in once. the past. I've collaborated with him multiple times. He's an absolute genius, the guy. He like is, him. yeah. Love him. And same thing with Salim Suleiman. Collaborated with him. Collaborated with the two brothers multiple times and absolutely love them. So lots of artists. Then, of course, um, Sunidhi Chauhan. I think she's got a spectacular show right now. It's uh, just how she's transformed herself. And she's easily one of the most versatile singers that India has ever had. She's just amazing. So he, she, her also, I've never had the opportunity to work with her. Would love to work with her at some point. So there are a lot of Indian artists that I would love to collaborate with. And have you come across anybody recently, uh, a young musician who you want to mention? Um, there are quite a few actually, because when I, uh, like, you know, when I open up social media, I see a lot of artists. And in fact, at... Uh, all about music. There was the showcase that uh, that I were that I'd uh, that I'd watched of all the artists. I think a lot of them like hash based. I have was, to mention this. Uh, you were extremely kind and uh, you know open uh, <laughs> to actually announce all the artists. Thank you so much for doing that. No, that, that was amazing. It was it was absolutely my pleasure. You know, to be in just to be in that room was uh, was amazing. And I was like, anyway, I'm going to be in that room watching everybody. Yeah, the other people who stood out at that particular show were the were the were the Dharavi Dream Project. 
Yeah. I thought they were amazing. The Dharavi kids, they were just so good. Uh, then Anushka Maske was part of that. Uh, I got to collaborate with her in uh, in Goa for a concert. So there are a lot of artists. There, there's uh, Mali. Uh, I think she's quite yeah. uh, amazing. Uh, I've been listening to her work and she's really, really good. So a lot of names actually, but they're not coming to my mind. But there are a lot of artists who are, uh, younger artists who are fantastic. So Ricky, we've learned a lot from your story. And uh, honestly, there are two, three takeaways for me already. Ek to, uh, that if you get an opportunity, if you see something, just try for it. Of course. Uh, either you will win. Yeah. Even if you fail, you will win an experience. Exactly. You know, there is no stress on that. And or be, you know that the door is closed. You know, that's it. True. <laughs> be when you're working with legendary people uh, and you have a difference of opinion, sometimes you should rest the difference of opinion for some time. Correct. Maybe your opinion also changes, change. you know, sometime. And uh, three, that there is no regular or a fixed path of success yeah. or a meaning of success. Uh, your career is completely different from the majority of musicians I know Correct. in my life. And I've worked, so I've spent time with a lot of them. So these three or four takeaways, there are, there are a lot more takeaways for people. But I'm personally learning these few things uh, from this. Uh, yesterday, we had put a post on social media. And we had, uh, you know, given a chance to, for the, the audience to ask questions. questions yeah. So we have a lot of questions from there. Sure. I'm going to take those questions. Wow, what a coin coincidence. I've recently been looping his soundtrack for Wild Karnataka. <laughs> and now this podcast announcement, love the podcast, by the way, continue bringing more. Thank you so much. Uh, questions. What's his earliest memory related to music? Earliest memory related to music? Actually, it was... Uh, I think my earliest memories were related to uh, uh, to nature, actually. So I grew up in America uh, for the first six years of my life. So uh, so my house was sort of in the middle of nowhere. A lot of forest areas around my home, lots of wooded areas. And we used to have a lot of creepy crawly animals that would enter my home, like snakes, lizards, chameleons, insects, frogs, you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, my parents and my teachers would always tell me that as soon as you see any of these animals, uh, you're supposed to step on them and kill them or you're supposed to run away from them or whatever. So at that small age, you know, when I was like three or four years old, my question to uh, my parents would be that uh, and my teachers would be that, you know, that if you're supposed to kill them the minute we see them, then why are they here, you know? Uh, why do they exist? And of course, now we realize that every single species of animal, no matter how seemingly small or insignificant, is a very important part oh, of no. our ecosystem. And True. it's this delicate balance of the ecosystem that keeps all of us alive. But those are the questions, those were my memories from a young age. You know, I was a very weird child. I used to like hanging around with these dangerous animals more than my friends, you know. <laughs> so that is what. <laughs> uh, being a world renowned artist, I'm sure he has come across various different music genres. Which one uh, he connects with the most? Which do I connect to the most? I connect with any uh, any style of music where there is a traditional cultural form and a contemporary cultural form. So like, for example, if it is a bowl musician with a DJ, you know, I like that. Or if it is a, uh, if it is an Indian classical musician with a Western classical musician. So I like... The I like fusion. It, yeah, fusion, but there has to be one traditional form and one contemporary, contemporary form. form, yeah. Super. Uh, which instrument or sound does he connect with most? I think any instrument which sort of can replicate the human voice beautifully, like a flute, it can bring about a bansuri, that is not the yeah. uh, Western uh, metal flute, but the, the bamboo flute, it can interpret the emotions of a human voice beautifully. Another one is a sarangi. It can emote uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the beauty of the human voice very, very well because of how the notes glide into each other. So I think these two instruments are absolutely beautiful. Very well. Uh, the soundtrack of Wild Karnataka really amplifies the narration and the story being shown like a mother's flight or a kitten having fun. What's his creation process like? How does his music convey the emotion so well? Does it come from the raga theory like certain ragas depict certain emotions? So Wild Karnataka is a beautiful film that uh, I had the pleasure of uh, composing music for. It's a film by Sir David Attenborough. So one of the greatest uh, uh, natural history filmmakers and creators ever. So, uh, so it, the whole film was based on the wildlife of the Western Ghats, that is mainly in Karnataka. So all Indian animals like, you know, like otters and uh, uh, this, uh, the tigers and elephants and, uh, you know, the wild cats, wild dogs, deer, all of these amazing, beautiful animals and snakes and things like that. 
So what happened was that uh, for me, I had two roles while making uh, the music for this film. One thing was that in uh, in most of these natural history documentaries where you see pristine environments and forests and wildlife, <clears throat> they could be from any part of the world. Because you see an elephant, it could be from anywhere. Or you see a snake, it could be from anywhere. Because you're not seeing humans in the film. There's no presenter in the movie. It's just beautiful wildlife. So I wanted to constantly remind the audience that that elephant you see in the frame, that is from India. That's an Indian citizen. I wanted to remind people that snake you see or that king cobra, that is basically an Indian citizen. So that is why I used a lot of Indian music to accentuate the movie. A lot of Indian instruments, lots of rags, lots of Indian classical stuff, whether it is West, whether it's a Karnataka classical or Hindustani classical. I used all of these forms and even folk forms. So that the sound is constantly reminding you that all of this is happening in India. So that was very important for me. Second thing that I had a rule while making that movie was that, in uh, which is a huge problem all over the world, that the music of a film, especially if it's a nature film or it involves an animal, it always vilifies an animal. Like for example, if you remember the film Jaws by uh, Steven Spielberg, the shark movie. What happens is that as soon as you see the shark, this dangerous, villainish music comes in. And that basically made everybody in the world f fear sharks. Or if you look at Jungle Book, Jungle Book, the tiger is the villain of the movie. And tiger is an endangered species. And it's not a bad animal, you know. It's, it, it, it's a beautiful animal, but it's the villain of the movie. And when the tiger dies in the end of the film, everybody's supposed to be very happy. Which is very, very irresponsible filmmaking in my opinion. Because children will grow up thinking that a tiger is a bad animal. So I do not want to vilify any animal. If a tiger is attacking a deer, and let's say the deer escapes. So obviously there has to be victory music that the deer has escaped and the deer has uh, escaped death. But you also have to feel sorry for the tiger because the deer is the food of the tiger. And if the tiger does not eat the deer, for another one week, the tiger will probably go hungry. And if it's a tigress and who has cubs, then not only the tigress will be uh, hungry, but all her cubs also will be hungry. So that is why I had to make sure that I'm very responsible when it comes to the music and not vilify the tiger, but also make people feel sorry for the tiger if the tiger does not kill the deer. Wow, it's a completely different perspective. <laughs> <laughs> What's next for him and for his listeners? Next, uh, th there is a new album that I'm uh, working on with uh, Stuart. Uh, image, yeah. With Stuart Copeland. So it's, uh, it's an orchestral album. We finished recording the album. We did uh, two days of recording at Abbey Road Studios in London, another two days at uh, Platoon Studios in London. And uh, right now I'm working on, uh, you know, post-producing the album, all the recordings are over. So it's all in my hands right now to finish off the album. So that is one album that I'm working on and a lot of other uh, singles I'm working on, you know, with various artists from around the world. So it's a lot of music basically that I'm working on. Yeah. Looking forward to that. Uh, what's your process of creating melodies like? What do you actually do when trying to come up with a melody? Do you sit on a piano or just noddle or there is an actual line of steps you follow? So uh, it always starts from an inspiration. It comes with a thought. Uh, so now the thing is that writer's block usually happens to people who are uh, who are uh, who have got deadlines, you know, who have to make something by a certain period of time. So that's why they've got writer's block, or they're they're wondering, uh, they're thinking from the perspective of somebody else, like you know, somebody who's briefed them to do something. For me, I don't get writer's block because I only make music when I feel like making music, and uh, uh, I make music on my own terms. So that's why I do not get writer's block. And uh, so for me, it is more about, as I'd mentioned earlier, that it is about inspiration strikes. Like, for example, if um, if I go into the forest and I see the plight of the elephants uh, and I want to communicate that. So it starts with that. How do I melodically, uh, you know, uh, uh, translate that uh, through the language of music and how do I communicate that through music? It could be through lyrics. It could be through an instrumental piece. It could be anything. And uh, and that's how it starts. It's It's very organic. So it's very difficult to figure out as to how a particular song started, you know, it could be, it could be various ways, but somehow organically it just gets created. <laughs> okay. How did you bypass the Bollywood industry and make an album that had global reach instead of just India? <laughs> <laughs> See, the thing about uh, Bollywood and the thing about uh, mainstream India is that uh, in India itself, we've got 1.4 billion people. We've got a diaspora, which is almost, uh, almost like 30 to 35 million all over the world. So the thing is that if we are just catering to an Indian audience, that is actually more than enough, you know. Because uh, so uh, uh, earlier in the earlier in the podcast, I said that you know that I wanted to break cultural barriers. That was a personal choice that I wanted to do. But at the same time, 
uh, if somebody makes a decision that they only want to cater to an Indian audience, they'll obviously get a much bigger audience than I would have ever dreamed of. Because the Indian audience itself is so huge, they're so appreciative. And if an Indian audience loves you, then you do not need love from anywhere else in the world. <laughs> so I believe that, uh, I believe that, uh, the, I think it is a huge success if one is able to cater to that Indian audience and, um, and get that Indian audience on your side. But for me, I wanted to break cultural barriers and I wanted to reach out to people who would normally not listen to Indian music and sort of reach out to them, as I mentioned, with the example of Pandit Ravi Shankar. So that is the path that I chose. Uh, he keep himself so much attached to the Indian culture, which reflects in his music. I guess that comes naturally, you know, like, for example, if you look at a, uh, like, let's say, uh, uh, an, uh, an Indian woman who's cooking for her family, let's take an example, or an Indian man cooking family, but let's take an example of an Indian woman. Uh, it, 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 she will be, she must be like a fantastically skilled chef. And she, uh, uh, she, uh, she, she wants to create a pasta for her family. So she creates the best possible pasta with the best ingredients and it is right on par with any Italian uh, chef and all of that stuff. But on the journey from the kitchen to the table, suddenly there'll be chili powder thrown into it and there'll be like a little bit of turmeric powder thrown into it. And it goes and that Indianness comes in because you just cannot take the Indianness out of an Indian person, you know. So it's the same thing with my music. Even if I try really hard to create a pure piece of blues music or jazz music or whatever, there'll always be Indianness thrown into it because that's how I think. It's you know? a default mode. It's a default mode, exactly. <laughs> that's the correct word. So Because that's how I think, you know. So I cannot think in, uh, in any other way. There are so many genres and most of the time trends set you into mediocrity. How he was able to stand different from crowd? I guess that obviously is a conscious effort because there's always that part of you which wants to do something to please an audience. Uh, you know, so it's always about like, you know, trying to draw that line as to where I will go, you know, without compromising on my own creativity and without compromising on my own personality in my music. Because that feeling is always there, the peer pressure, you know, that you want to, you want to create something that everybody loves, you know. Uh, but then you start realizing that I'm in the music profession because I'm passionate about music. And there are a lot of people who are musicians, dancers, sculptors, painters, but they end up, when they get into the profession, they end up doing things which they do not like doing. You know, so what is the point of getting into it? You could have just been an engineer, you could have just been a, you could have been doing a job that you don't like and making a lot of money. Why are you in this profession? You know, so I believe that if you are in the arts, you are in the arts for a reason because you love doing it. So within the arts, you should be trying to create stuff that you like creating. Superb. Any advice for young musicians who want to represent India globally? So my only advice is this that, uh, is that, uh, you know, it's a myth that uh, that if you want to, if, if international recognition is what you crave for and global recognition is what you crave for, that you need to create music in English, you need to create, you know, Western forms of pop music and hip hop music in Western styles and all of that stuff. It, it's completely untrue because the only people in this world, I mean, in India, who have actually gotten international recognition are people who have dug deep into their own roots True. and have figured out what is it that makes them uniquely Indian and created music which was purely themselves and purely what represented themselves as and their Indianness in them. Like if you look at me, the, all three of my awards were for Indian albums. If you look at Pandit Vishwamohan Bhatt won a Grammy Award, Pandit Ravi Shankar, the recent Grammy Awards with uh, Shakti, Shakti and with Bella Fleck, uh, Bella Fleck's album, uh, Pashto. So the thing is that every single person who has ever gotten international recognition in India has been people who have created music where they were true to themselves. Now, I'm not saying that everybody needs to create Indian classical music because some people are not Indian classical musicians, but you just have to be true to yourself because global audiences look for honesty in your music. They look for a, a part of your own personality in your music. Uh, so, like, uh, every single artist, there is a, even if it's a pop artist like Britney Spears, if you listen to Britney Spears' music, you know what kind of a person she is. If you listen to Adele's music, you know what kind of a person she is. If you listen to Michael Jackson's music, you know what kind of a person he was. It's the same thing. And it's the same thing with every art form. Like, if you look at uh, a person like Vincent Van Gogh, uh, one of the greatest contemporary painters. I'm taking his example because he was more of a contemporary painter, not like Leonardo da Vinci or something, more contemporary. If he was making a new painting, 
I can't even imagine him going to all the neighboring art galleries and saying, "Okay, what is everybody doing?" You know, let me do something similar, or what is in fashion right now? Let me make a painting like that. He's just going to dig deep into his own soul, and he's going to create something that is an extension of his own personality and his beliefs. And if I wanted to know what kind of a person Vincent Van Gogh was, I'm not going to read a book about him. I'm going to look at all of his paintings, and I'm going to see, okay, this guy was a tormented individual, or this guy used to think in a very psychedelic way. You know, so that's how I'm going to judge him. I'm going to judge him based on his art. So I'm just hoping that more and more people in India start creating art, uh, especially music, which is based on their own personality, so that I can listen to the music and I can say that okay, this person was this kind of a person, kind of a person. Okay, they will sit. I'm in Mumbai and I'm a big fan of your compositions. How can I sing under your banner? <laughs> <laughs> Do studio recordings with you? No, uh, I mean it's very easy to get in touch with me. I'm one of the most accessible persons, so I guess one can just reach out to me on Instagram, direct messages, and I always respond to my messages. Fantastic. Uh, be prepared to be swarmed. <laughs> Could he please share some artist name that he collaborated with him for Wild Karnataka? So Wild Karnataka, a lot of artists actually. Like uh, there was there's, there's this guy called Pramod Kiran who's a brilliant kunakol artist. You know where he recites the syllables of a of a percussion instrument of a South Indian percussion instrument. So we had him. Uh, then we had Vari Jashri Venu Gopal who's a brilliant flute player and a Karnataka vocalist. She sung almost throughout the. Soundtrack. We have another person called Charan Raj, who is a very successful Kannada film composer, but also I know him more as a Karnataka classical vocalist and uh, a brilliant overall musician. So he sung on the uh, sung on the soundtrack. Then of course we had an orchestra from London who uh, we recorded uh, we recorded with the the basis of the score that is the orchestral part of it was recorded by them. All the solos were recorded in India. We also had a sitar player, a lady called Sumarani. We had another percussion player, a guy called Arun Kumar. All South Indian musicians. <laughs> What's the one collaboration you've been wanting for a long time? So, so the one collaboration that I've been waiting for a long time. Uh, I don't know actually. Like uh, the, as we discuss, a lot of Indian artists that I've been wanting to collaborate with. Mm. So I guess uh, uh, the artist that I mentioned earlier, and in addition to that, uh, uh, I would say that uh, you know Hans Zimmer is somebody who I've always admired because not only as a great film composer but also a great producer. A person who understands visuals beautifully and underscores it very well uh, through music. So, would love to collaborate with him just to understand his mind space and to understand uh, uh, to understand his process. As a teenager who wants to pursue music production as a career, what would you advise? So, as a, uh, I would say that uh, one has to be extremely hardworking when it comes to music production. Uh, you cannot uh, think of it in terms of like a nine to five job or think of it that. The minute you get into music production, you want to start making money. I mean, you need to treat the profession with a lot of respect. Just like how, if somebody were to become an engineer, you would go to college for four years and start at the bottom, and you know, and go uh, and rise up the ladder. I guess in music production also the similar thing applies. And also try to, uh, I would say, uh, uh, it's very important to stay humble in a profession as a music producer because it takes a very very long time to reach a stage where you can actually call the shots. True. You know, as a music producer, so I guess work with a lot of people, work under a lot of people, learn from a lot of people, and only when you are absolutely ready, uh, take up a project which is initiated by you. How was your interaction with Odisha? And recently, you composed a beautiful song for Odisha. So I love the state of Odisha. Uh, I've been to Odisha multiple times, spent a lot of time with the tribal farmers in Odisha, especially in Korapur, in Bolpur, a bunch of other places. Uh, so the thing is that uh, my love for Odisha actually is because of. Uh, because of the huge millet mission that they have, now millet is a super grain. It's a super food simply because it's not only good for the planet. It's bajra, also, right? Bajra, yeah. Uh, bajra ragi, all of that stuff. The whole family. It's uh, it's a super food because it gives you all the nutrition that your body requires. But also, it's good for the planet because if you look at a paddy field, like you know where you grow rice, you just have to flood it with water. It's water intensive. The crop. It's difficult to grow. It's difficult to harvest. Whereas millet can grow in pretty much any climatic condition, it uses very little water, so it's fantastic for the planet. So, so the Odisha government has been pushing millet a lot, you know, the, the, as a as a crop that you know that everybody uh, everybody should have on their you know on their tables and in their diet and things like that. So I created uh, an anthem for uh, Odisha for their millet mission. It's a song called Mandia because Mandia means millet in Odia. And what I did for that song is that to show appreciation to the tribals who are the flag bearers of millet. 
in the state, I actually traveled the length and breadth of Odisha and I actually recorded with the tribal farmers and I incorporated their voices and I incorporated their music into that particular song. Fantastic. So that was a project that I'm really proud of. And of course, I will constantly work with the government of Odisha on various projects and uh, I really like what they're doing. Thank you. It's really good. Uh, if winning a Grammy is a dream for an artist, what steps would you suggest to as a checklist? First step would be that the aim should not be to win a Grammy. That is, and I'm not saying this as a very ethical or a moral thing or whatever, but that is the correct way. Because the minute you start aiming to win a Grammy, you start making compromises to your creativity. Because you start looking at a goal, end goal in sight, and then what happens is that you start gearing everything, thinking in a very, uh, 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 thinking in a very unfound, uh, you know, uh, in a misguided fashion that, you know, that this will probably lead me to the Grammy. I would say that the aspiration for winning the Grammy should happen after the creativity finishes. So once you create something that you feel is your best possible product and it's an amazing track, then maybe look at entering it in for the Grammys and uh, hopefully like, you know, uh, getting uh, rewarded for it. How do you overcome judgment as an artist, especially when you are from a middle class family? How do I overcome judgment? So I think I touched upon that a little bit earlier that uh, as an artist, uh, that's, the, that's the point that, you know, that as an artist, you're constantly opening yourself up to judgment. And there is no way to sidestep that. There's no way to avoid that. Because the minute you put out a piece of art into the world, um, people are going to judge it. Now, the thing is that uh, it's up to us to figure out what judgments can we take constructively and what judgments do we have to throw out of the window. Because sometimes some judgments come out of malice. Some judgments come out of people who do not like you as a person. So those judgments, you do not have to take that seriously. Uh, some judgments come out from a, uh, from a uh, need for people to troll you. So those judgments you have to sort of like, you know, not take seriously. But there is that whole other judgment where people tell you stuff where you can actually use that constructively when you're creating music at a later stage. So I think that is something that, uh, uh, that you can take seriously. And also sometimes we as artists, uh, like, you know, uh, when we are creating music at the back of our mind, we are thinking that, oh, you know, the drums are actually... Uh, you know, were not required in this particular song. We should not have had drums in the song you're thinking, but but you feel that, no, no, it's all right. It's all right. Let's just release it. I think it's sounding all right. And then the first comment that comes up is that the drums are not working in that track, you know? <laughs> and then you realize that, okay, this person has given validation to what I was thinking about in the first place, you know? So then those comments, those criticisms and those judgments are very important. And you must have been rejected several times. Like you prepared a track played it to somebody, or sometimes you release something it didn't work. Yeah. How do you handle rejection? It's very difficult to say actually, because uh, when it came uh, um, to an earlier stage when, uh, you know, when I was doing commercials, uh, again, like, you know, ads and uh, doing jingles. that part of my life, doing, when I was doing jingles. So there, rejection used to happen pretty much on a regular basis. Like every second or third day, I used to, uh, I, uh, you know, a client would tell me that, oh, I don't like this, you have to redo it or you know, this is not sounding good or this is not sounding correct for the brand. But in those days, it was different simply because it uh, it was not about creating something that was amazing. It is about creating something that was correct. You know, like, uh, for example, if I created a beautiful piece of music for, let's say, Kingfisher beer, and it's absolutely amazing, that piece of music, I cannot use that same music for Mercedes-Benz. True. You know, so even though the Kingfisher beer music was absolutely amazing and the best musicians in the world, because at the end of the day, what works for a brand, one brand does not work for another brand. Correct. So everything is about being correct for the brand and wrong for the brand. So one has to constantly remind yourself that the rejection is not a reflection of your capabilities as a musician. But the rejection is about your capabilities of doing something that the brand manager wants or something that is correct for the brand. So that was a different kind of rejection. Right now, the rejection is that, you know, sometimes when I make a piece of music and, uh, you know, and uh, it does not reach the kind of you know, numbers that you were hoping it would reach or you would dream it would reach or, um, you know, or uh, uh, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes uh, you know, you're hoping that, uh, you know, how it is with social media, you're hoping that a lot of people share the music and that's that particular thing is not happening. There could be multiple reasons for it because today nobody actually knows what works and what does not work. Nobody knows exactly, uh, you know, what actually goes viral and what does not. You know, there are so many factors in play, which uh, which actually uh, dictate all of this. Sometimes virality can be pushed, sometimes it cannot be pushed. 
So one just has to be happy that you know that you've created something that you absolutely love yourself, and uh, you know, and uh, uh, just hope that it goes. Like uh, I'll give you an example. There was a track which I'd done for EMI a, a label. Okay. It is a track called Celebration. Uh, it was in an album called Mesmerizing Santur. It was an album that I'd done. I think it was in 2008 or 2009. I did this album for EMI, and the album uh, during those days there were physical products, so the CD sold quite well. It sold. Uh, thousands and thousands of CDs and all of that stuff, and that particular track celebration was track number seven or eight. So it was one of the non-descript tracks and tracks that you know was not like the lead track on the album. And then suddenly, like last year uh, during Diwali, uh, I'm getting a whole lot of notifications on Instagram. This is like what, like 16 years later? Yeah, 16. No, no. Yeah, about 16 years later, I get all these notifications on Instagram, and then I look at it and I see that. There are there are all there are in, uh, on a single day there were like about a hundred thousand reels created with that uh, piece of music, and I was wondering how did that happen. So then I went to create a reel and I typed in Diwali and the first track that was coming up was that one, and then I'm like, how do you do these things? You know, how do these things happen? And this was a track that I myself was finding it difficult to remember that it was mine or not. You know, so <laughs> it was because it was done so long back and it was one of the side B tracks as they say. You know, on the on the album. So one does not know how a how a song can become successful or not. You just have to create the best piece of music that you are happy with. Uh, in your entire journey, if I had to say that, who are the most important people? Do you want to thank specific people? So I would say number one would be my parents. My parents are not at all musical. They were against my musical career. <laughs> in fact, even now, because I finished off the dental degree that my father asked me to do. When we go for our family events and all of that stuff, weddings and all of that, people come to me. Oh, hey, Ricky, I love your music and uh, you're doing so well. I like that album of yours and congratulations on the Grammy Award and things. My father comes over there, but he's also a doctor, <laughs> <laughs> so he's like that. And same thing with my mom. But the thing which I appreciate about them is that my parents, uh, parents had money, you know. So they uh, uh, they were not like super rich, but they were decently rich and they were comfortable. Now the thing is that even though I have not taken a penny from them when it comes to my musical career, when it comes to my musical edu education, when it comes to my uh, my uh, what do you call that, uh, my traveling, I've not taken any money from them at all. But the thing is that I could make decisions which were very risky because I knew that there'll be food on the table. You know, so that way I do not have to make decisions which uh, where I uh, I had I could be I had to become a small time musician or I could not think big. Because I knew that worst situation, what will happen? I'll just go crying to my dad, and I'll say, "Can I have some money?" And he'll definitely give me money. He'll never refuse. And of course, I never had to do that. But the thing is that that gift of them being uh, uh, what do you call that decently moneyed helped me. They gave you the comfort to fail. They gave me the comfort to fail. You articulated it beautifully. So they basically gave me the comfort to fail. So that is something that I'm very uh, grateful to them about. Then uh, there's a person who I mentioned earlier in the podcast, a person called Rod Liner. Who basically former vice president of Universal Music? So he, uh, uh, in I think about 1999 or 2000, I had released this album um, uh, with a small label in uh, in India, and it was my first album that I had put out. So I was very happy, and they had made like just a few hundred copies of the album. But I was so excited, you know, that I had an album and I had a CD and all of that stuff. So this uh, friend of mine in uh, New York, he uh, he knew about this yoga store over there. And he said that you know yours is nice music which can be used for yoga and stuff like that. It's a yoga store. They sell yoga mats and incense sticks and things like that. Why don't you send in a few of your albums? Uh, they'll probably sell those CDs, even though they don't sell CDs there. So I said fine. So I took about ten of those CDs, put it into a, a FedEx box, spent a lot of money during those days, and I sent it to America. And six months later, at about uh, uh, I think about twelve o'clock at night India time, I get a call uh, from a US number on my landline. And uh, I uh, pick up the phone, and he says that I'm Rod Lynham. I'm vice president of Universal Music. Uh, can I speak with Ricky? I'm like I'm Ricky speaking. Then he's like, it was very difficult for me to get your phone number. I had to really figure it out how to get it. But he's like, six months ago, I bought this CD from this yoga store, and it's been in my car for the last six months, and I love it. And I just thought that you know that I am the vice president of a major label, so why don't I just work with this guy? And then I realized that you're a kid. You are like about 19 or 20 years old. Are you signed with the label? I said no. Then he's like, I want to sign you up for a deal. I want to do at least six albums with you. Then I'm like, wow. wow. And then he became again, just like Stuart, he became a father figure to me. He's never been married, never had children. 
So then after that, he invited me to Los Angeles. I stayed at his place. Even till today, we both are, he's no longer works with Universal, but uh, he's retired now, but we are extremely close right now. He's still like a mentor, a father figure to me. Every time I go to Los Angeles, I spend some time with him and, you know, so that's what. So these are the relationships that Nikki, I absolutely You have cherish. so many amazing things in your story, you know. The Stuart Copeland thing, yeah. the Wiscraft and yeah. this Jingles thing and this one. Now, all of these are, you know, unbelievable yeah. in, in one sense and when way. But uh, if you were, you wouldn't have taken that first step, nothing of it would have happened. No, true. And also the thing is that uh, if I may say so, if I may praise myself a little bit, I'm, <laughs> I'm very good at maintaining relationships because I, I'm very genuine in these relationships. Like when I say that Rod Lynam is a father figure to me, he's truly a father figure to me. Like uh, uh, major life decisions, I always call him up for that and I talk to him about it. You know, and same thing with Stuart. If I say that he's like an older, I mean, he's also like a father figure, but he gets very angry when I call him that. But, <laughs> but, but, but you know, because we had this thing, you know, when we were just starting to work with each other. Uh, what happened is that he told me that, oh, I've performed in India with the police. You know, I'd come to Bombay and I'd performed in Bombay. Did you come for that concert? So I said, no. Then he's like, why? Uh, you said you're a fan of the police. I said that that concert happened in 1981, four months before I was born. So, <laughs> so that was, so that is the kind of a thing, you know? So, uh, but basically, um, uh, for me, these are very, very genuine. All of these relationships that I've had with people, even in India also, there is this uh, record label executive who used to be with EMI in India. Now he's got a label called Strum, a person called uh, T Suresh. Very, very uh, close friend of mine. Again, a person who's a mentor to me. Constantly call him up every time I have any issues or I need any advice. So I've got all of these beautiful relationships and people who have stood by me and I'm extremely grateful to them. And uh, like how singers do Riyaz, uh, as a composer, what do you do? <laughs> as a composer, I'm constantly in front of my uh, computer and, uh, you know, and uh, it, I always travel with a setup. Uh, so I work on planes. I've got like a small MIDI keyboard and I've got my laptop and uh, you know, and I'm uh, on planes like long planes. If it's like a 12 hour ride, I'm sitting and I'm making music over there with headphones. And uh, so I'm constantly, you know, doing that. And, and for me, music is always on my mind. Like right now, I'm talking to you right now. In my mind, I'm composing a soundtrack for a conversation. Is so it romantic? <laughs> 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 but yeah, I'm constantly doing that. Even if I'm walking, uh, uh, I'm walking anywhere. My footsteps are in some sort of a rhythm and I'm making something on, I'm creating something on top of that. So for me, it's like a complete obsession. So, uh, so as I said, you know, the more you compose, the better you get at it. So that's the thing about composition. And about playing uh, the keyboard and playing the piano, I mean that unfortunately, I'm not practicing as much as I should be. But I guess with the shows, you know, uh, we have rehearsals for the shows and we have, uh, you know, we have uh, the show itself. So I, uh, I mean, I keep, rem I keep consoling myself that that is practice enough, but that's not true at all. Uh, what kind of gadgets do you own? Uh, musical instruments or what is the softwares you use? Uh, quite a lot, actually. So I'm a completely a PC guy. So I've got, uh, I use uh, completely P uh, PCs for my music creation process, my laptops, everything. So I love this, uh, this Lenovo laptop that I have, which is basically a dual screen laptop. It opens up like a clamshell. So uh, the thing is that because it uh, it allows you to have dual screens when you're working on the go. So I like that. Then I've got a couple of gaming laptops that I use for uh, music creation process. Got about four or five of them. Gaming laptops. Gaming laptops, because they are very powerful. Yeah. So they work uh, quite well. It's just that they're very difficult to carry around. So I've got those. And then I've got a huge bunch of analog synths. So I realized that the best way to get these ancient analog synths, which are true analog synths, not like the digital analog synths that you get from stores nowadays or uh, online and things like that. So I realized that the best way to get it is that there are these old uh, Russian and German ships, you know, that uh, when these ships uh, get decommissioned, there are these companies that go in and their job is to just break down the ship and sell it for parts. Yeah, yeah. And these ships have got these ancient analog synths. Oh, so nice. I started networking with uh, with uh, these uh, companies across the world who break down these ships. And I told them that like, you know, the, the if you see anything, which is like a keyboard and it's extremely heavy and it has got all these Russian and German, you know, language uh, uh, text on it, then immediately let me know. So now I've got a collection of about 20 or 30 of these 
um, I think closer to 30 of these uh, of these analog synths, which are absolutely amazing. They're very difficult to use. And they require a lot of repair and they require a lot of maintenance and things like that because they're not digital. They're completely 100% analog. So I've got a bunch of those and I've got a bunch of the regular keyboards that everybody has and um, yeah, the usual gadgets that you would see in a studio, preamps and things like that. And you've spent a lot of time in India and the broad board. Yeah. If you have to change one thing in the entire music ecosystem, what would you like to change or improve rather? So I would say musicians need to be paid more fairly for the recordings because previously when there was physical media, it was easier for musicians to be paid for the recordings because, you know, the thing is that physical media sells and, uh, you know, and uh, musicians make their money on the sales. But right now with streaming, it's become a little com more complicated. Streaming has got its advantages that you can reach out to more people uh, through streaming and it's easier for people to access your music. So maybe through the streaming popularity that you get, you can make money off other things. So one has to figure out how to monetize that newfound, uh, you know, popularity that you can get through streaming. But at the same time, what streaming has done is that streaming has reduced the pride of ownership when it comes to music. Because uh, in the past, you know, like a person would buy a CD and then Correct. they would uh, they would have the pride of ownership. When friends would come home, they would open it up and say that this is this new music that I discovered and they would play the music. And if it's on your shelf, then you're going to listen to it for the rest of your life. Whereas now music has become very volatile. It's become like ether where, uh, you know, people do not even want to waste space on their phone by keeping an MP3 on their phone. People just want to stream music. And that is why music is being forgotten as easily as uh, the music, uh, you know, is, is streamed. So like when people listen to a piece of music, it does not last for more than three or four months on, uh, you know, on, on a playlist or on a, uh, on, uh, in people's memories. So I guess that uh, if somehow we can get that pride of ownership back, then it will give a chance for more songs to stand the test of time and become immortal. And my last question uh, for now, uh, how would you like your fans to perceive you or, uh, you know, think about you or your music? So how would I like my fans to perceive me? Uh, <laughs> I guess I would like uh, people to just agree with me. You know, that that is what I want as a musician, you know, because I make music from the heart. And I just want people to agree with me that, you know, that even they like my music, that's all. And uh, they like the, and uh, they agree with what I'm trying to say through my music. So I guess if I get enough people to agree with me, that is, uh, uh, that is good. But how would they like to perceive me? Uh, I don't know, hopefully as a, uh, <laughs> it's difficult to say actually, maybe like uh, some part of me wants uh, people to believe that I'm a, I'm a good musician. So I would, uh, it would be great if people think that, uh, that I'm a good musician and I'm perceived like that. Again, I, I can't put it in words actually. I guess people to just, uh, I, I, I just, just want that people to love you. Probably. And accept you everybody, the way you are. everybody wants that, you know, like that, yeah. uh, that validation would be, True. Uh, would be super special. Ricky, thank you so much. Thank you. You know, this has been an amazing experience for me. Uh, I want to share because when I started researching about you and met you for the first time, I think it's everything happens for a reason. Yeah. Uh, because I'm meeting you for the first time, everything is fresh to me. Yeah. And I actually got to learn a lot. Oh. And I'm hundred percent sure whoever is listening to this podcast or watching this podcast is will get to learn a lot. Thank you so much for being uh, so honest and uh, so comfortable and making me comfortable. Uh, I think I've made very little mistake in my English today. <laughs> this will improve. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much.